Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Monday, May 18th Dublin City Council work session. Uh, this is a live stream version due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the state's emergency declaration. This work session will be conducted via an online platform and live stream via YouTube at the city's website, which is permitted as a result of passage of uh, sub bill, House Bill 197, which includes temporary changes to the Ohio Open Meetings laws are practice. Work sessions are designed for in-depth discussion of various topics by staff and council members. There will be opportunity for public input and comment when these items are brought forward at a later date as part of a regular council agenda. To review tonight's work session on YouTube, please visit the website. With that, Anne, would you please call the roll? I'm sure. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Here. Mr. Reiner? Here. Ms. Fox? Here. Vice Mayor DeRosa? Here. Mayor Amaros Grooms? Here. Mr. Peterson? Here. And Ms. Saludo? Here. Thank you, Ann. Um, we're going to have several uh, topics we're going to cover tonight. We're going to hear from uh, Megan O'Callaghan on the Council Chambers edition. We're going to hear from Matt Earman on the North Pool. And we're going to hear from Matt Stifler with a CIP update. Uh, there are a number of topics we would like to perhaps touch on uh, that have come up since the agenda was initially published, uh, if time permits, uh, at the end of this. So with that, General, you want to get us started? Uh, good evening. Thanks, members of council, for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. Uh, you may recall we originally had scheduled a work session to discuss sort of the formation of the what would be the proposed 21 through 25 the capital improvement program. Uh, we want to call an audible to that and do something a little different, given the conditions that we're in. A couple things. Uh, first of all, to give you an update on the latter uh, side of this, as the mayor pointed out, Matt Stifler will give you a, an overview uh, regarding where we see the CIP uh, for 2020 going into 2021 based on the situation that we have that, as we know it right now. Um, it, you've been briefed on the operating budget in a similar fashion. We thought it would be good to touch base on the capital budget. Similarly, we have a couple projects that are going to be hitting your agenda here pretty soon, one of which will be the, uh, the new council chambers uh, facility as well as the replacement of the North Pool. So we wanted to give you an update on those first. So as the mayor mentioned, Megan will give you an update, uh, Matt Ehrman will give you an update, and then I've asked Matt Stifler to, to back clean up on that and then show how um, you know, those projects kind of lie within the, uh, the new norm of this budget. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it right over to Megan, unless you have any questions of me. You know, before Megan, before you start, I would, sorry about that. What I would add is that we will show a schedule on the back end of Matt's presentation, Matt Stifler's presentation about sort of the way ahead relative to the 2125 CIP wherein we're really suggesting to take that conversation up more in the August timeframe once we get further into July and have a better understanding of how revenues are looking. We have done the exercise at staff level to start uh, putting that together to see what those requests and things look like. So just so you know that that's uh, what we'll be asking for later. Thank you. Okay, good evening, members of council. As you are aware, we've made significant progress towards realizing the city's long-term vision for the area of Kaufman Park and the consolidation of city hall operations or city operations in general with the goal of facilitating more effective services as the center of municipal government. The overall effort has involved four city facilities as shown on the screen and several phases of design and construction projects, as well as a series of staff moves. So I wanted to start by providing an update on the overall project and you can see we have several tasks completed. Horn and King started design of the renovations and the council chambers edition in May of 2019. We initiated construction with Rosilli in December of 2019 with the renovations of the existing building to prepare it to become the new city hall. And that work was completed in early April of 2020. In mid-April, city hall staff began occupying the new city hall building. And just last week, the IT department moved out of the development building on Shire Rings Road and into the service center. 
We're wrapping up some minor renovations and maintenance of the former city hall building to prepare it to become the new development building. And the development department is going to be moving over the next couple of weeks um, into the 5200 Emerald Parkway building. And then we'll be vacating the 5800 Shire Rings Road building. Um, and finally, Rosilli has turned their efforts to bidding phase three, which is the new council chambers addition portion of the project. So these are some of the renderings that we presented to city council last October and at the public open house in early December. And these renderings still hold true. Um, this is a rendering of the site with the council chamber addition and the associated parking lot expansion. The pair of buildings are designed to be architecturally compatible and they have a great association with the green space that surrounds it, which also provides for a variety of opportunities for public engagement. The council building um, also provides convenient access to the administration offices building, which provides for operational efficiencies. These are renderings of the front and rear exteriors of the existing building and the addition. The addition will be 11,675 square feet. And you can see there's a covered porch area that wraps around the addition that will provide a nice outdoor area for public gatherings. This is a newer 3D view looking at the northwest corner. You can see an emblem on the exterior of the council chamber portion of the building. We haven't decided what's going to be on that emblem, but we wanted to show it um, just for illustrative purposes. We hadn't shown that previously, but that's something that has come from the steering committee process. And this is a rendering of the exterior of the building from another angle. The council chamber is the large area in the middle with all the seats shown in the center of the screen. The design accommodates significant opportunities for both public and staff meetings. Um, council members and clerk of council have direct, direct and easy access to the council area. And the council chamber is designed to accommodate large sessions and can also open up into the lobby area. We're currently showing about 114 seats in the council chamber utilizing the furniture arrangement that's shown. Um, it can be rearranged in different um, formats as necessary though. Um, we're also incorporating first class presentation and communication technologies in all portions of the building. Public spaces have comfortable opportunities for gathering. And then you can see there's great display opportunities through this gallery area where we anticipate displaying some historical pieces, public art, gifts that we've received from others. Um, so that's going to be a great um, entrance way into the building gather, gallery and then into the lobby and the council chamber itself. Um, the first guaranteed maximum price contract that we executed with Rosilli was exclusive to the renovations of the existing building. I'm focusing this presentation on the council chamber addition. So starting with um, guaranteed maximum price contract number two, that um, what had $295,000 and $120 of work associated with the council chamber addition. The remainder of that contract was for the renovations portion of the project. So of the work that was included in this second GMP for the council chamber addition, it included demolition of the existing west side canopy. It included some concrete pads for generator, um, some masonry infill, infills on the side of the building where the addition will be connecting to the existing building. Um, some drywall paint on that side of the building where the connection will occur. It included some plumbing and gas, electrical work for a generator, and also a fire alarm panel so that the addition could be added to the fire alarm system. So there has been some work already um, performed that was necessary due to the addition or the anticipated addition that would be constructed. And then finally, Rosilli is wrapping up bidding and preparing for their GMP number three proposal to the city, which includes the balance of the work for the addition. And we're currently estimating GMP three will come in around 5.7 million. And we plan to present a resolution pending the discussion this evening to council on June 8th. As far as the schedule goes moving forward, 
um, that will include resolution pending the discussion to council on June 8th. And if approved, construction would begin immediately in June of 2020, and it would take about a year. So it would wrap up in the summer of 2021. And that concludes my presentation portion of the um, overall presentation on the council chamber edition. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then I'll be turning it over to Matt. I have a question for you, uh, Megan. Um, the, um, we were interrupted because of the pandemic as a steering committee to choose some finishes, that sort of thing. Where, where are we on all of that right now? And, and I know finishes do kind of play into the estimate and that sort of thing. Yeah, so we've instructed Rosilli to include some allowances. So we have carpet allowances and then there'll be notes in the contract that provide for us to make those decisions about exact colors and materials and things like that as construction proceeds. Some of the feedback that I had heard during the steering committee was it might be easier once we see you know, the actual building go up to make some of those decisions and to visualize some of those materials. So that's why we chose to go that route. So there, there will be opportunities remaining during construction for the steering committee to have input into those decisions as far as colors and materials and things like that. We have the allowances covered. Okay, so, well, I guess I'm confused because I don't think we even got as far as color combinations for sure. Uh, whether it would be wood on on the fronts of the, I mean, I thought there was quite a bit of material selection still to be done. There are still selections, but again, we have those accounted for with allowances. So okay. we provided we estimates and we have ranges in there. So we'll be able to make decisions and we, we incorporated some assumptions and then you know, we discuss the pricing from those assumptions. And if for some reason we make a decision during construction that exceeds the allowance or that takes um, the decision making process above that which is provided in the contract then we would need to discuss a change order for that right so i guess i would just we have those adequately covered in the estimate i just wondered if having those not chosen would create cost overruns that we don't expect that's the only thing i was worried about because it seems like there was quite a bit of finishing that hadn't been decided and that that can be a large portion of a project yeah, and it was difficult. We had, you know, electronic samples of finishes and it was just difficult to envision what those electronic swatches up on screens would look like in the vast area of the council chamber, for example. So, and, and now it's even more difficult to, you know, visit design galleries or things like that um, in light of the pandemic. So that's why we decided just to go the allowance route. And that's right. pretty typical. Um, Is it's there a ability to have savings though if let's just say the allowance is larger than we think then we don't spend that much money when you have a contract like this is there an ability to have a savings you don't spend that much on these so as long as you don't meet that allowance the savings comes back to the city right is that what you're there saying absolutely is yeah okay. so yeah we outline the uh, the assumptions that are made that um, inform those allowance prices. And yeah, if we make a decision that is more cost effective than the assumption we outlined in the contract, we okay. get those savings. And likewise, on the other side, if we right. made a decision that's more costly than the assumption that we had included, then we okay. would have changed. So it's line item. All right, thank you. Yeah. We'll also have uh, some significant savings as uh, Mr. Keeler will be building the, uh, the conference table the council, uh, the council meeting room. So, Megan, uh, I, that's part great. Of Megan, I have a question for you. Are is Roselli has Roselli been given the uh, remainder of the five million dollar contract, or is that still out uh, for possible bids by other people? I mean, I it's great that he moved his headquarters over here, and and uh, I, you know, I'm just curious where we're at. Is, is, is he the contractor now of choice? So we, yeah, we went through a competitive selection process um, prior to beginning the renovations for the entire project, the renovations and the addition. And we have executed GMP one for the renovations. GMP two included a portion of the renovations or the balance of the renovations and a portion of the addition. And then GMP three is the balance of the addition. They are this month, they've been bidding the packages associated with the addition. 
So they are, you know, they have been procuring work from subcontractors to, and they will take the pricing that they've received from subcontractors, put that into a GMP proposal and present that to the city. So the work that goes into that balance of the addition is all competitively bid by Rosilli to the subcontracting industry. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. So Megan, if I'm looking at the uh, CIP for 2020 to 2024, and there is um, 6 million in that for the council chamber, and then there's 750,000 for new city hall furniture fixtures and minor renovations. So 6.7 million. Yeah, so Matt will talk about the funding a little later during his presentation, but um, we do have the $6 million and the, the 5.7 estimate that I had included in the presentation. There are some costs that we'll incur outside of the GMP with Rosilli because we purchased some things like AV and some, um, you know, there's permitting, there's just costs that occur outside of the actual construction contract with Rosilli, but Matt will address where we are with the overall funding later on in his portion of the presentation. Thank you. Megan, hey. is, is the, um, that's a bit, sorry, just popped in my head. Is the AV equipment and, and the, the technology, is that part of the capital or is that part of the operating budget? It's part of the capital budget. It is. Overall okay. capital budget, yes. Okay, thank you. So with that, I will hand it over to Matterman to discuss the North Pool project. Good evening, members of council. Um, thank you for the opportunity here. I wanna bring you up to date on the North Pool renovation project. Uh, we have reached the point of a very uh, prominent decision-making time here for this project. So I wanted to get you up to speed on it and bring forward some of the uh, potential options in front of us. But just to give you a little bit of a background on this, uh, you all know very well how important this community or this facility is for the community and how well it's used and how popular it is. Uh, we've uh, gone to great lengths to understand the nuances between this pool and the South Pool. And believe it or not, this pool still remains a slightly popular, more uh, visited amenity than the South Pool does. Um, some of the cost estimate influences on this, um, we, we recognized that there were a couple of different comparable pro, uh, projects out there. So we took, the, took it upon ourselves to take, make sure we understood what those popular amenities were with this, this facility so that we could make sure that we incorporated those into the design. Uh, some of the uh, existing structures that are on site today, some of the storage buildings and mechanical buildings can be salvageable uh, with a new facade on the outside of the buildings to capture the new design of the uh, of the new building. And so the original cost that we used, the cost estimate in 2017 was $6 million. And so just to get a little bit of idea of the cost estimates and comparable projects around Central Ohio we use, we have the City of Grand Bites pool. Uh, the cost there between 16 and 17 was $6.3 million. Um, and remind you to take into account that some of the existing structures we have, we figured there was a cost savings there, of fairly significant dollars that we, we captured into our estimate. In the city of Athens municipal pool, uh, 2017 and 2018, revisiting our estimate, you'll recall there was a significant shift in design. I'll get into that in, in a minute. Uh, so we felt like we let's just keep the estimate as it is today until we fish out all of the items that we need to with the community. You'll recall um, several of you attended a few of these workshops, if not all of them. And you'll remember uh, we started this process in the fall of 2018 and took seven uh, community workshops over a year's worth of time to capture the very strong opinions of the community as to what this facility would actually become. So we did an introduction very early on to the program or the project itself. And you'll recall there was a very strong swim team presence at the uh, inception of the, the public sessions, which 
took us into a little bit of a, or a lot of a new direction with the idea of an indoor outdoor structure uh, that would be used year round for swim teams and other events. And of course, indoor swimming during the, the cooler months. We uh, actually did about a six month research process and site visits to understand what those possibilities might be and brought them back to the public. And at that point, the neighborhood was very strongly present at these meetings and were not um, happy about the idea of a year round facility. Uh, they liked the idea, but they didn't want it in their backyard. So we redesigned or reshifted the design back to just a general community pool, as you'll recall, and took uh, several meetings there to refine those concepts. And we received a lot of input, as, as many of you all know. And at the very end, there was some noteworthy acceptance of the final design and concept. Now, mind you, throughout this process, for those of you all that did attend these meetings, there was a significant amount of conversation, at least that I like to highlight in those meetings, is that there is a budget we are working from and decisions have to be made of cutting or not cutting things. And we will take their input back and go back to a design and get some estimates and find out how strong or, or how off we might have been on those estimates. The results of those community meetings left us with this site plan. And in general, I'll just discuss it in brief detail. The leisure pool, the main leisure pool area is quite larger than the just general open space of the existing pool. And that was based on the northern end of this pool. They wanted a larger, very shallow area for in between infants and toddler stages for parents to be able to hang out with their little ones before they ventured out into the deeper water. Also, this pool would incorporate lap swimming lanes for recreational swimmers. We heard a very large volume of people that wanted additional lap space or lap swimming space. Uh, this could be used in conjunction with the lap pool itself or in combination with. Also, um, having the lap pool here and separated, it allows us to keep our swim team operations a little bit more separate from the functionality of the pool. If you've ever been at one of our pools during a swim meet, you'll know how crowded it is and how dysfunctional the pool can become if we're not uh, paying close attention to all of the activities going on. And then we have the slide area here. You'll see this. some of the things noted on here have changed very slightly in our attempt to reduce these costs. But this is a separate slide pool with a discharge pool that's not incongruent with the, or it's not congruent with the leisure pool to keep people from entering into that pool and limiting the space of that pool. The waiting pool here has a zero depth entry, which was highly requested. Uh, the, the round shape gives us an opportunity to, um, um, just for the lack of better words, it's easier for parents to see through a, a, an oval or a, a round circular shape than it is a, a square rectangular shape. And then we've got the existing spray feature here that we are salvaging. There's no need to, to get rid of this facility. It works and functions quite well. We will repurpose this building here as the mechanical room for that structure. And you'll see the note, the landscaping throughout, there is a, a very keen sight line that allows you to look pretty much all the way down the entire campus of the pools for adding safety um, enhancements and so forth. And of course, leaving the lawn space intact with the trees, as many as we could save in this area, there are no trees that are coming down except for those that we had to take out earlier that were, that were diseased and they will be replaced here um, in this fall. In addition to that, these two bu buildings here would be new, the, a new mechanical room, and, uh, and then we've got the uh, lifeguard room and admissions area here with bathhouse and concession on this end with seating for concession on the northern end here. I'll show you some more informative renderings here in just a bit. Uh, this parking lot here was um, requested uh, for additional parking spaces. And this design here gives us approximately 18 new parking spaces or additional parking spaces. This area right here has been added as a drop-off area. As you know, there are several cars that are parked here a long time trying to pick up and drop off kids and getting them out of the flow of traffic will keep this area a little bit more um, trafficable. So the current design renderings are shown here 
with the building and you can see here the concept of an open space it's a very resort look and feel to this uh, with a fairly contemporary looking building with features and materials that will complement the residential neighborhood rather than stand alone as a more of a commercial or industrial uh, looking building and you can see some of the renderings here with some of the woodwork and trellises and and so forth and a little bit more of a grandiose entryway to define that entrance. So to update you on the cost estimate here, you'll, you'll recall in 2017, the cost estimate was $6 million. Based on all the input we received from our, from our residents on the scope of the project and the size of the pool surface area, the separation of pools and so forth, um, resulted in more somewhat of a domino effect, but in some ways not. I have on here some increased stormwater facilities. I want to make sure that I under that you understand that the stormwater infrastructure that exists out on this site today is managed by that pond on the north side of Arlington Park near the near the uh, the barn. And the date at which that was constructed, it doesn't meet today's standards. Regardless of whether we added pool space or not, we still would have had to to add some bioretention ponds or uh, dry basin um, areas for water to trickle into that pond rather than us having to go in and redo the entire system and take up a larger area of that park. So this was necessary for us to be able to accommodate the the, the adjustments made, made to the pool. And then of course the increased parking does add some more of that stormwater, adding in some of the, the cost associated with that. You can see those are some of the added numbers this section here is a, a totaling approximately $1.4 million estimated cost extra uh, in addition to. And then there's some miscellaneous cost increases with additional pool space. Uh, the building size requirements were needed to be increased to, uh, to accommodate the, the pool capacity, certainly taking into effect the three years of inflation uh, back in 2000, from, from 2017. There was an increase in some deck space, some enhanced pool access point into the lap pool, which allows you to enter the pool through a, a series of steps before you actually get into the lap lane areas, which is something that was uh, desired. And then, of course, we have increased contingencies on the price that or the estimated cost. Um, some of the design work that we're going through now and certainly our owner's rep and some of the other contingents or some of the other um, uh, miscellaneous costs for um, all of this construction. So we are now at an updated cost estimate at $8.5 million. I will tell you, we have gone through a series of value engineering, the estimates and the design and making sure that we can strip out anything and everything that is absolutely not necessary for this project. Any more uh, stripping of items is going to significantly alter what we heard from the public and their expectation in this project, just to just so you're clear, we would have to literally either eliminate pools or combine pools or reduce and reduce the size of pools. So it would be a significant change in order to accommodate this, this variance here. So where we stand today, we have an original capital fund of $6 million. There is a design funds saving that is on here. You'll recall, maybe you will, or maybe you won't. We increased the design fees associated with the idea of an indoor outdoor facility, which substan substantially increased the design fees. Since we didn't need that money, this money is actually allocated for this project. Therefore, we have a total fund availability of $6.5 million with the updated cost estimate at 8.5. That leaves us a balance of deficiency of $2 million. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Stifler to come and have a conversation about what does that mean in the way of options? Because I'm sure that's going to be the first question that's asked. Matt? Sure, I have a presentation to discuss the capital budget overall with the discussion of the funding options at the end of that presentation. If council has any questions about the design, itself, it might be appropriate to take those questions now and then talk about the potential funding options at the end of my presentation. Okay. So the schedule we're looking at now um, is always subject to change. We all know that. 
It's, it's uh, dependent on a lot of things that are out of our control. But what we're looking at now is being able to take all of the site development plan and the building plan to planning and zoning at the June 11th meeting. And if that is approved at that meeting and they don't have any additional changes to make to the plan, we will likely be able to bring to, to council a review of the, the GMP construction contract to make to get the project moving forward. It's a special note that it, it, this isn't about an 11 month construction schedule with a little bit of room on the end for us to actually operate this pool before it actually opens on the first day. And if we commence um, anywhere after July 1st, it is all likelihood that we would not be able to open the pool in time for Memorial Day weekend in 2021. So I just wanna make sure everybody understands that um, we are on a tight schedule here at this point. And with that, I'll take any questions. Matt, I have a, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, please. No, Matt, I just have one question. I just had a curiosity because we do some large projects for the parks and we do, we work with, you know, design firms uh, like this all the time. When they finish design, and I know that in their, their final submission, they usually have a cost estimate. Do you, do you see in your experience that um, when they get to that point, they, they are fairly close to what these general, these contractors come back with their RFPs. How yeah, far off are we on these sorts of things? Well, I will, I will say that, you know, the design of this, the real design work of this began in October of last year. So the design team from MSA Architects has been working on the design. Now the design actually hits different phases of percentage of, of completion. We like to get the, the idea of an estimate somewhere around the 60% just to see where we are in a ballpark and they'll go out and ask subs about what that looks like. Unfortunately, they're not, they're, the design that they're looking at is not complete enough for them to give really hard numbers on them. And it's not until about the 90% phase when they start really looking at these and getting hard numbers from uh, subcontractors. They didn't have the design for this from that point. Um, well, they did for some of the some of the site work and so forth. So they have the, had that for for a while. I'd say in, in January we had our first numbers this year, and then when the when the building came online, the numbers were blown way out of proportion to the budget. So we really had to dig deep and find ways for us to redesign areas that would not affect the overall scope of the project. So that took some time to do. It took a few months to do that. And then we get the design back up to that 90% phase. And then we go out and get hard numbers on, I'll just say better numbers because of the level of detail that we receive at that point. So I would say, you know, we have only been sitting on those numbers now for maybe six to eight weeks. Okay. So we've, we've it's okay. been fairly fluent or fluid. So would it, would it be fair to say that normally you don't, well, because we you know, wanted such intense community engagement and we did come back with a design that pleased so many people and so many entities, normally do you go out at 60% and do that or do you usually wait until you get to about a 90% or you, you pretty much know what the final design on these major projects are? Uh, it, the reason I'm asking this, Matt, is because I know that we asked for community engagement on the pool. I know we went back and asked for more community engagement on the park. And because of that, we had, we had cost increases, right? So what I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand here is learn a lesson for ourselves on at what point do we bring in the community so that we don't end up having inflated numbers that we don't expect, I guess. So what is, what is, uh, What's a good practice here? Is it get this information, get these designs done, and then bid, and then take it out for uh, bid estimates around ninety percent? And and uh, in other words, what can we do to improve our ability to keep these numbers and not get surprises like this? I think there's there's a philosophical question here that you're asking for us as a community. I know that we all value public input as much as we possible possibly can for everything we do. And then there's the other side of things about introducing ideas to the community that would fit into a specific budget 
but sometimes that is often looked at as we are telling the community what we're going to do and not listening to what they want. So we have, we have, we have um, intentionally started with the community first. And when we do that, we, we get surveys and we understand what the high priorities are for the community. And then we'll put together a site plan based on those surveys. And that's when it starts growing because that's, that's where, you know, that is a $6 million project in the, in the, in the package. And then we get the community involved and, you know, there are other things that they want added. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I, it was every single one of these meetings I kept explaining to people that there is a possibility we're going to run into some budget issues on this. And we knew going in and it was going to be higher than we expected, but we did not expect this much of a difference. And a lot of that is due to the unknown of some of the stormwater issues and, and you know, other related items on that right. list. And so. last question, and, I'll, and then I'll stop, um, is because of, of the, uh, the situation we're in now, um, I don't know what construction costs are now. I don't know if, if, if it's better to look at, I mean, I don't, it, I know we have the RFP. We, I, I don't know that we, we'll probably go to contract. Is there any savings and rebidding and that sort of thing? Um, well, we haven't gotten hard numbers on everything right now. We're, um, we, we are working on getting those numbers. And it, as far as we know, we anticipate some savings on the bid package. But what that is, I don't know, because with the economy opening back up and the, for instance, you know, the governor un, un, uh, announced uh, last week that we can open our pools on May 26th. Well, guess what all the pool contractors are doing now? So yeah. they're, they're, I don't know what the, the, the market is looking like right now. General construction, I think we'd be fine, but specialized construction such as pools right now, I do know that the pool companies are bombarded with requests right now. So. Okay. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome. You know, um, one of the, and Matt, you mentioned we want public input and we want participation and all that stuff. Uh, obviously, that's the reason why we do all of this is to represent this community. One of the things you got to be careful of when you ask people for input is you're going to get it. And um, I would imagine, Matt, when you said that there was a strong presence of the swim teams and the people that are interested in swim lanes and all that sort of stuff you know, you would expect them to show up and ask for the kind of asset that they want to use. Yeah. Who doesn't show up at those kind of community input or the people who don't necessarily have a voice. In. You, you're not going to get, um, you know, a retired couple who live down, you know, on the south end of Dublin to go to one of those things to say, well, now, wait a minute, we got to make sure that the budget stays in line. You know, we got to make sure that we don't spend, and so that's sort of our job as the representatives of the whole community to balance that, the voice of the people who do show up and say what they want. And sometimes it's hard to do because when you, I mean, the, the swim team is a very vocal part of our community and they will be very, very loud and very um, committed and passionate about what they want. I remember when they came in and we talked about the swim coach and all those other issues, it is a very passionate group and they aren't generally going to show up and say, well, we need to make sure we stay in the budget and we need to make sure that we can still pay for all the other capital improvement programs. And so I think that when people show up to these meetings and you get that input, it by definition causes the project to go up in price. Um, and also another unique thing I, th thing I think about this, Matt, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, the pool is a little bit more weather dependent than some of our other projects because you know, getting it finished in late October is of no use whatsoever. You either need to have it finished early in the summer so you can use it, or you might as well wait for another year. And so when you combine sort of all of the extra bells and whistles that got put on it, and the fact that there is inherently a, um, a time pressure because of the nature of the product, I think those things combined have put us where we are. And I, I agree with what you said, Jane, that we got to uh, you know, watch and be mindful when we add these things, what it does to the budget. When we go through the kind of process that we went through, particularly with this pool, um, you just knew every time we were going to have another meeting, there were going to be more wish list items that came along or things that were going to cause the price to go up. So, you know, Greg, you bring up a good point that I want to clarify and 
um, and explain. I will tell you there was a lot of swim team presence at these meetings for sure. But at the end of the day, I feel as though the design was accommodating more of the recreational swimmer than it was the swim team. And that's the recreational lap swimmer, if you will. You know, adding lap lanes to the leisure pool only lets us accommodate more recreational swimming and gives us options on more functional use of that pool. We can use that pool for a whole lot of different, and in a lot of different ways now. You'll, you know, this, the South Pool design is a very unique design in that it's so freeform that you really can't have any structured types of things in the pool and the water depths go down to zero. This pool, you have a rectangular shape, which gives you a whole lot more opportunities for activities in that pool. So I uh, just want to make sure that we know that it wasn't the swim teams that designed this, this particular um, rendition. So Matt, if you told uh, everyone all along that we should be over budget and to expect some changes to the extent that we were over budget, um, tell me what your recommendations are to get it back closer to the budget we had initially set, given that we had anticipated if we go over budget, we'll make some changes all along? Well, we considered a lot of options here to the point of even not replacing the existing buildings out there, but to replace, a, you know, put a brand new pool in without replacing those existing buildings. I don't know if you've been in those buildings, but they are in need of drastic renovations to the point where I wouldn't, all of the assessments we've had has, has indicated don't, don't keep those buildings. The only way that I think we could really make a difference in the $2 million overage is, um, well, there really isn't unless we eliminate a pool, combine pools onto the same water as, as the other pool. So you have one mechanical system that brings a whole level of issues potentially with accidental water quality um, uh, incidents that happen. So um, the only way that we would be able to reduce the cost down to 6 million is to almost eliminate an entire pool out of this, out of this design. Matt, um, I attended, I think two meetings last fall maybe one in September or October, and then another one late November. Um, I heard 6 million in both of those meetings. Um, in the second meeting, I noticed noteworthy acceptance of the final design. I heard that from the audience at uh, Wyandotte Elementary. I thought that was the final design and there seemed to be buy-in to the design that was shown then. And I have 6 million stuck in my head. I guess when, when I look at the design you presented, I can't necessarily tell the difference between what you're showing and what I saw in say September or November. I can tell you the building itself looks a lot better. So maybe, Maybe the $6 million estimate assumed that we kept the old buildings. Um, a 40% increase, you know, if, if, if I were, if I walked into a car dealership and I was, had in my head, I'm going to buy a $60,000 car and I walked out of there with an $85,000 car, <laughs> that would raise a little eyebrows. Um, obviously, it changed the, uh, changes the economics of the whole thing. So, Help me understand how we got from those meetings, which I thought were the final, the residents were bought into it, they understood. They were making certain suggestions. We'd like to have this, we'd like to have that. But I thought that the design that I saw in that final meeting at Wyandotte was the final product. And we were gonna start breaking ground here this spring. So we were ready to move. Um, tell me what, where I misunderstood. Um, back to the slide that I had up here. Let me bring that back up here. Can you all see this? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. 
So if you look at each of these items here, for instance, to increase pool surface area, this is where I'm talking about, you have the potential of reducing the pool space. There's approximately 4,000, 3,500 to 4,000 additional square feet of, of usable pool. Matt, There's we're looking at the um, city of Athens one right now. Oh, interesting. that better this is the updated cost estimate okay that's what i was referring to thank you so if you look at the increased pool surface area the pool went from about ten thousand and some change square feet to almost fourteen thousand square feet so there's an additional square footage there of a cost of six hundred and thirty one thousand dollars to that square footage that in itself could be reduced but you would be left with a very small leisure pool uh, that wouldn't provide the amenities that the um the public was was seeking in there and then i mentioned you know the separation of pools you can you can combine mechanical systems and so forth but these things um as we discussed them all along during the public input meeting we knew we were pushing the limit to the six million dollar budget our architect was saying we are probably at or above budget at that final meeting based on the, pre the comparable costs associated with the other pools that I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation. So we were under the impression that we were going to, we were likely going to be pushing this budget, but it wasn't out of the question that it would be exceeding to the dollar that it is today. Okay. I know, I know that Kathy was there and uh, I think Christina was there. So I may, may be off base. Maybe I'm, I missed something. I just remember my, my recollection was in that, what I thought was the final meeting, the, the uh, pool surface area looked about the same. There was definitely three or more bodies of water. And I remember specifically the argument for that was you could shut one section of the pool down for a, you know, a biohazard or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so to me, maybe there's the, where the slides come in, you've added that. I just, you know, as a resident, I was thinking that it was the final iteration that we were all kind of buying into. And I was buying into, okay, it's this iteration for $6 million that passes the sniff test. Uh, so I guess I've missed something between the end of last year and where we are today. Mayor, if I could weigh in, I, I think fundamentally part of what's missing, and I was going to mention this earlier in the discussion, is some of it is timing of CIP. I mean, last year, we went through our CIP process. We were pretty much, we were wrapped up before we got into this level of the discussion relative to this. I think we probably could have done a, um, an interim <clears throat> update had CIP probably even been in the traditional time frame, but the last couple of years we moved our CIP timing up. We, we, had we been on that traditional time frame, we probably would have been about the same timing of this discussion. But even though, you know, we could have shown a design or a map that looks like this, we had not value engineered yet beyond that to really get a full understanding of what that estimate would be. I, I think at that point, you remember we were basing a pool cost on the 2017 estimate against other like pools that we thought we might be building. And then when you add to that, the, the input process that actually started separating out these wells, I'll call them for the different pools. Um, I think, I think that's where some of that cost. I mean, there's, $500,000 or $200 and some thousand dollars in some of the piping issues underlying separating these wells. There's another 250,000. So it's about $520,000 of difference just right there in stormwater regulations, which we weren't changes, which we weren't even aware of until we got into more finite design. So the bottom line is you got a pool that's two and a half million dollars more than we had estimated. A lot of that doesn't happen until you get into the finite, more finite engineering and design, and then the the sort of the, the vetting out of those costs. Um, I had asked Matt, which is part of the uh, a delay in the early part of this year, to go back and 
figure out what they could squeeze out of this, um, hoping that we could squeeze this down further. It didn't happen. <laughs> I didn't want to be the bearer of bad news, but here I am, the bearer of bad news. Um, I mean, the good news is, uh, I think what Matt, will, Matt Stifler will brief you with here, but the price tag is the price tag after, after um, you know, value engineering, and I can't change that. Uh, the only way that that's going to change and get back to a $6 million pool is if we go back and, and design back down. I mean, your analogy of, of the car, you still have a choice. You still have a choice as to whether you want to buy the $85,000 car or the $60,000 car. And that's, that's part of our job is to make sure that you know, these are the different components that are that are coming together. And this is where we are. I wish we were here about two months earlier, to be honest with you, but we're not. And uh, there's a lot of reasons I could give you why we're not, but but we're not. So um, but that's where we are. Hey, Matt. Back to Andy. Oh, excuse me. I have, um, Matt, I had a couple of things. I, I attended all seven of those meetings from the very beginning to the very last one. Um, and at the very first meeting, I know the costs that were being discussed were significantly higher. And on several occasions, I mean, I made comments about cost, you made comments about cost. And I think a very interesting thing happened during the course of those seven meetings is when people would bring up costs, because what we're seeing here, I think if, if the residents had had their way, it, it would have even more than what's sitting on the screen here that there was very good back and forth between the residents and the designers about things. And, and Matt on more one occasion or the designer would say, we can't do this. As far as the three separate waters, it was my understanding that that was a design suggestion from the architects actually from a cost perspective because it requires separate pumping. So it wasn't necessarily a cost savings if you put all this together and that was their design suggestion. So I think one of the things that's really interesting here is the residents, I, I don't believe it was the residents adding things to this design. I, I, I think it actually was designed down from some of those original estimates. For instance, the swim team very much wanted 50 meter lanes as we talked about several times. And those don't exist in this plan because again, there was conversation about the cost back and forth. So um, as Andy said, at the end of the day, I, I think the back and forth was, yes, there was probably some shaving to do, but a lot of this, a lot of this layout was the design consultant's suggestions um, and reactions from the residents and not the other way around. I think it's very important to do that because the residents work very hard on this. And I, and again, I, I don't think a lot of, certainly the stormwater, certainly the inflation and a variety of those things were not necessarily the residents' suggestions. In fact, they were very reasonable during the course of this about what could and couldn't happen. For instance, I don't remember, I know we discussed something in that parking lot, the parking lot cost of 200 and some thousand. I know that parking lot we shared with the school so I, I, I don't know if we have to add those 18 spots this year, if that's not something that can be done next year or stormwaters, et cetera. But I, I just think it's important that, that the input, input from the residents, I think they were very reasonable. And, I, and again, I, the design consultants are the ones that put these, no resident drew what was on this particular screen. And as Andy said, I think that they left with, um, very good feelings that it was a mutual conversation, um, including the including the swim team. Although disappointed, certainly there wasn't a covered pool, but um, there was strong and positive feedback. So when I look at the parking lot and if, if look at a few things, maybe there's a few things that we can move out over time. But I just think it's really important to say I, I think the residents did a terrific job in their feedback on this, and and um, and they're given their take. Thanks. I got a comment. Uh, Andy mentioned the, uh, the the three bodies of water. What? How much of this pool would we lose percentage-wise? Looking at it, twenty percent, thirty percent. If we went back to the other size of pool, because it says you know increased pool is six hundred thirty thousand, and then how how would that affect the two hundred and twenty-five thousand in storm water if we had less water to manage? I'm just sort of curious you know, what, what the size was, I get that, you know, we're enlarging it, but what was the original size? 
Uh, the original size of all the bodies of water together combined was about 10, a little over 10,000 square feet. The issue with the stormwater is more or less based on the, the, the standards that the current stormwater system was built to. So if we do any renovations to this pool, we, we have to meet the new regulations, which is driving, you know, there's no real option as far as storm drain, uh, stormwater um, savings on this. So the uh, the uh, pool that Andy was referring to, and Kathy, I just curious, like if I'm sitting there, sitting looking at this um, graphic, the 600 and dollars added twenty percent, forty percent, sixty percent. How much did it add to the leisure pool area? I'm just sort of curious. Um, it added a little over 3,000 square feet, and I'll, I'll, t I'll if you can see the hand on here, there's an yep. area down here that I referred to earlier that um, is is a body of water that would accommodate moms with toddlers rather than infants. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a struggle between the use of the le at the, the current uh, pool. There's a struggle between the depth of the water of the leisure pool versus the top pool that doesn't really give a transition for those parents with with people with uh, infants versus toddlers. So this gives a little bit more of an interaction area with the parents, gives more functionality to the whole pool space. And then the deeper water in this area allows for a lot of uh, additional types of uses versus the, the pool design that we have out there currently today, just because of the shape, if nothing else. Yeah, we modified the pool in Merrifield to sort of meet what you just said. I was just wondering, gosh, you know, the, the savings, um, you know, it's a pretty nice size toddler pool too, I was thinking, and maybe my scale's wrong. The other question I guess I'm looking at is the actual architecture of the structure. I, just, I, I guess there's a giant laminated beams coming out, supporting the roof, and, you know, it's, it's really pretty neat. And I guess the thing that I'm really interested in, Matt, is the long-term maintenance, you know, how our staff felt about the structure and was it put together as the most efficient structure for long-term maintenance and you know I'm looking at this thing it's really rather cool looking I gotta say uh, and then another cost savings I was thinking about that we started employing over here on our two pools was the use of uh, shade canvas you know we got a pretty extensive trellis thing running through the whole thing and I don't know what that's worth but in the end, we found out that we had a huge deficit in shade for the visitors because none of them want to be cooked out there with their children and grandchildren, which is what exactly what was happening. So I don't know if you guys looked at uh, the shade cloth system for part of this, which seems to be really cost effective over the long run from what our analysis was. Um, you, know, you got any comments on any of that? Yeah, as far as the shade structures go, you can see these sail canvas shade structures here, here, here. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, uh, structures out in the lawn area that exist today. There's a problem with those just in the, in the form of they're too high off the ground to provide shade where you actually need them. So we might be able to adjust those, but we've pretty much taken some of this stuff out thing and we're, we can add this in later. The trellis work around the building that you see here, we have reduced that significantly, almost in half. The problem if we keep going and reduce that more is we're going to have a, a preference problem with planning and zoning about the design of this building and not meeting certain standards that are expected from the, from the commission. So we're getting some device, uh, advice from our planning staff on this. So obviously, as, as they add things to it, landscaping and otherwise, it, it, it starts adding to the cost of the, of the program or the, the project as well. So there's a lot of factors going into this. Yeah, I'm sort of looking at the shade structures and I'm thinking as the sun passes over here and uh, yeah, we had to bring an astronomer out to calculate our shade uh, patterns to get it right. Um, I'm looking at this thing and I'm thinking, okay, as the sun hits it, is it show throwing up? Is it just an architectural embellishment and since you said it's been reduced, or is it really functional? And as the sun passes over this thing, that people are going to have their lounge chairs pulled up underneath it. Well, it depends on what you're referring to specifically. 
Uh, the whole arcade uh, crosses the whole uh, front elevation of the building. This building here. Yeah. That is actually the west facing side of that building. So it's not going to be functional for shade. It's more for aesthetics uh, for the, uh, the building itself. You can see there are columns here. Um, it's more of just an architecturally, uh, aesthetically pleasing type of a structure more than anything else. Okay. Again, and then on the, ma the maintenance of this structure, and that's of course what every city council person and Dana and all of us are really worried about as we're looking at these things we're building. I don't know, and you do maybe, to what depth you went in on how are we gonna maintain this thing? Is this gonna be uh, inexpensive to maintain, cost effective to maintain over the years? What's its life and these kind of things, you know? And that was in choosing the materials and the architecture, so. You yeah, any comments on that at all? We expressed significant concern about potential maintenance issues with all of the wood terracing around the build, the trellis around the building. Uh, we have modified the material from wood to a steel, which would re which uh, reduces the amount of maintenance significantly uh, from sanding and staining and or painting and so forth. So. We have gone through great lengths with the architect to reduce the size of that trellis as well as the material of that trellis to make sure it's easily maintained. The building itself is a fairly simple structure and I, I, I can't say for sure how much maintenance it's going to need, need versus not, but that was certainly an, an equation into the discussion with the architects. I can follow up with them if you need more details on that. I'm just curious because, you know, it's nice to build all this great stuff we're building, and we certainly are building a great city. But the next question is for the guys and gals coming after us for the next 20, 30 years, I don't want them being uh, sidecarred by outrageous uh, maintenance fees, keep all this stuff going. So it, it's really an important factor in me seeing anything built in this community. So. Well, I, I appreciate your concern and comparing with the South Pool, for instance, there's a lot of uh, exposed wood down there and it was originally built with shaker shingles, uh, both of which are fairly high maintenance items, um, but we have since changed that roof. This one does not have any shaker shingles. It's got a very simple, um, I can't remember the, the design of the roof itself, but it is, it is an easily maintained roof and doesn't need to be replaced every 20 years kind of thing. So I, I think we've done our diligence on those types of items. Well, no matter what happens here, uh, as you reduce costs or you're working your way through this, you might again think of these uh, sales because they're very inexpensive. They have a really long life. They're easy to put up and require no more than sinking some, uh, some guideposts and cement and uh, you start getting the shade that people really want. We finally resolve that over here after a number of years. So just I don't know if the architect got into that or not and did you know, track the sun to see how this whole thing really works for the benefit of the residents. I, I just, I, you know, those are items, of course, I wouldn't know, but those are real important to the people that end up using this facility. You know, John, one of the things that came up a fair bit is on that particular piece of property, there's a lot of mature trees and there's a lot of, there's a nice hill that goes up that you really can't see the, the topology on these diagrams too much. And the residents were, you know, as you said, adamant, you know, keep the trees, keep the shade, keep those types of things. But they're the ground surrounding this, which is going to stay largely the same as I understand it, right, Matt? There's some lovely shading on that. Um, and then as Matt said, the current structures, the residents said, if you just tilt them a bit or do some things, they can even add more shade. So I, I think the, the residents provided some strong, strong suggestions on, on that, which I think are gonna be doable. Is that, is that what you feel, Matt? Yes, I agree with that. Now, that's really important because if you're taking your children or grandchildren over to these places for four hours or five hours and you have guests, the shade factor almost ends up being a, a fight to get into the shade and everybody else is left out to roast in the sun. And of course, we've all experienced these problems already in our past pools. So just something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to make one more comment and I want to clarify something that I said about the engagement. One, 
I think, um, you know, it is reasonable that you, when you estimate something in 2017, by the time you take it out to bid at 2020, you're going to expect to see some increased costs. There's no doubt about that. But when I made my uh, question to Matt about the engagement piece, I think there's a little lesson here to be learned by all of us in that the last two times we've had these big cost overruns is because we bring the community in sort of on the back end of an already done design. It happened with the park, we went back, we improved it some. Same thing with the North Pool. And um, I think the lesson here is, is that if we get them in there early, maybe we don't get so far in a design and then hear what the residents have to say. And then we always get a better design, which I think is great. And it speaks to the fact that we're good listeners and a lot of voices coming to the table bring a lot of good ideas. But it might be something to think about, about just getting people in there a little earlier so we don't go back and redo a design, which ends up costing us money. So I, I personally think that there is an element here in the way of, uh, spending the extra money because we are creating a quality of life that's going to be around for a long time. And I think of, of the circle of things that we look at, infrastructure and um, resilience and economic uh, development, that creating a long-standing, long-term, beautiful amenity is also an economic development piece. So I, I think you have to weigh it on all sides. No one wants to see a $2 million overrun but balancing it out, I think there's some good lessons here, so. Jane, just for clarification on your comment, I appreciate it. Uh, you, you said that we should be getting the public in earlier. Are you talking about during the development of our capital budget and the funding requests that come forward to, to, to fund such a project? Or are you talking about when we actually start the design work to include them in the first phase of design? Yeah, I think that, Matt. I think more that than anything. Okay. Um, and I know that's hard and that takes time. Well, but and I, they were engaged at the very forefront. They, we started right. with the community with surveys and then public meetings to hear them out. And then we started putting pieces of the picture together. Yeah. That's where. I, it, yeah. And I do think that we've, we've uh, improved in many ways the way we make, we have this public engagement instead of just a small group, we're, we're doing more town halls and that sort of thing and getting more information out on the internet about people making suggestions. And I, I think we're learning how to improve our public engagement in these design processes, but the earlier the better. But I, but I also appreciate that, you know, there comes a point where you have to have, you have to say that's it and we've got a budget, and we've got to stop here and we've got to just get it finished. There's no doubt about that, but, um, but it happened with the park too. We kind of sent it back because we weren't sure, we weren't sure that it was good enough yet. And those kinds of things cost money, so. Understood. Anyway, it's a beautiful design and I, I have a feeling that it's exactly what the community wants from what um, everybody said about the meetings. Well, I think we're going to hear more from uh, Matt Stifler about, you know, what do we do about this? I, I don't know if I've heard consensus if we're all okay to spend the extra two and a half million dollars or not. I think um, that discussion is one that we will continue having. Um, you know, I, these pools don't last forever. I, I worked at this pool the year that it opened. And um, so, I, you know, I'm old, Chris, but I'm not. Cutting out, Chris. You keep cutting out, honey. Okay, no, hang on. Let me kick all of my family off the internet. Um, I just am trying to reiterate this, this is not a, a super forever term solution. You know, I, I worked at this pool the year that it opened. And, um, you know, it, it certainly is a lot of money. And I, you know, I don't know what we have to have the conversation is do we want to go this far over budget? Are we all all right with this or are we not? So um, let's go ahead and listen to Matt and tell, and he will share with us, you know, where that money would come from, what it would look like. Uh, and those kinds of things. And, and then maybe we can talk about, are we comfortable moving forward or do we need to take a step back? Okay, can everybody see my screen? 
Perfect, yeah. thank you. So uh, we thought we'd start with a, a kind of an update on the capital improvement program in general before we engage in a North Pool discussion specifically. I'll go through this um, relatively quickly because it mirrors a lot of the discussion and the conclusions in the format that we saw for the operating budget. So our agenda this evening includes a discussion of fund balance, revenues, uh, initial uh, plan of action on some potential uh, project expenditure reductions, the status of the capital budget, of course, a discussion then on the North Pool budget, since we just had the discussion on the North Pool, and then a short discussion on an amended schedule. So this is the bottom line slide up front. And um, what this slide demonstrates is that we're in a relatively stable position uh, for the capital budget as compared to the operating budget. Despite the potential loss of some income tax revenue, we've identified um, potential additional revenue sources as well as some expenditure reductions in 2020 that we could do that will keep the capital program moving forward regardless of the magnitude of loss in income tax. So these figures here will be kind of further explained as we move through the presentation, but the bottom line is we've identified approximately $12.3 million in a worst case scenario that we could bring forward from uh, expenditure reductions and revenue increases uh, in order to uh, make the 2020 capital program work. So starting with where we're at today, this is a quick recap of our fund balance. As you can see, we have approximately 900,000 at the bottom of the page that's in the unallocated fund balance. So what that means is that money is not uh, appropriated, obviously, but it also means that it's not allocated for any carryover projects from 2019 whose appropriation has expired that we plan on doing in 2020. So this is the most conservative fund balance estimate. If we were to take any action, council would have to take action to approve that additional 1.4 million on those 2019 uh, expenditures. So the unappropriated fund balance is really that third line, which is the $2.3 million, which is very near the fund balance that was shown in ordinance 10-20 at a previous council meeting. It's also important to point out that the capital improvements fund currently includes the $6 million appropriation in that supplemental audience, uh, ordinance for the council chamber addition. That's in the fourth line up, that's $6.1 million. So currently the council chamber addition is fully funded in the capital program through that ordinance. All right, some other important things to note as we're discussing the capital improvement program. It occurs to me, we don't typically do something like this. We don't typically stop about halfway through or really frankly, right at the beginning of a capital budget program and talk about where we're at. And, you know, maybe it's something we should do, but it's not something we typically do. And it's important to understand that the capital improve, improvement program undergoes a significant number of changes from its development to adoption to execution. And typically the finance department executes as many of these changes as we can throughout this process. And it's one of the main reasons why we bring a supplemental appropriation to council on a quarterly basis is to make these adjustments in the capital budget. There's more variability in costs with a less ability to control costs in a capital budget. And I think we just had a really good discussion on how that kind of plays out in reality. And there are numerous projects where that, that ends up being true. I think as the city manager also mentioned, it's important to point out that this, this capital budget is really about 15 months old in many cases. Departments submitted their request to finance in March of last year, and it's substantially unchanged from that point. Of course, there are other decisions that are, be, that are made after that point, but in a lot of ways, the estimates are set at that point. And there's also an additional number of funds that provides both a complexity to the capital budget but also a great deal more opportunity than we see in the operating budget. So let's look at some revenue. So these are the revenue sources that fund the capital budget. Um, the revenue sources identified in green are estimated to be minimally impacted by the COVID-19 emergency. The cash resources identified in yellow may contain a resource that is impacted by this emergency. And it's important to note that the capital improvements program is significantly less reliant on income taxes than the operating budget. As you'll recall, 
20, 25% of the income tax is dedicated to the capital improvements program and 75% is dedicated to the operating budget. That makes up the large majority of the operating budget. It actually only makes up a small part, not a small part, it makes up about a third of the capital improvements program. The capital improvements program is really built on property taxes and service payment revenue. And those are properties, uh, payments on the assessed value of real property. Those are the most resilient form of uh, revenues in a crisis like this. And the capital improvement program really benefits from that resiliency as we'll see throughout this discussion. Going through each of these in a little bit more detail now will be the remainder of the presentation. And I'm gonna move through them fairly quickly because it follows a similar line to the operating budget. Of course, we have property taxes. I'm taking a conservative approach here and estimating that we may see a reduction of up to $200,000. I actually probably should have created a best, moderate and worst case scenario when the best case scenario would actually be zero. So I'm taking a fairly conservative approach and saying that we may see a reduction in property taxes. I'm taking a fairly conservative approach on all of these slides because I want to make sure to give you a full picture of, of what we might be looking at. There are other funds that support the CIP process. In general, the Hotel Motel Fund is a small supporter uh, for technology related expenditures um, that may occur that support the Events Administration Division or the Hotel Motel Fund uh, in general. There's also the six and a half million dollar transfer from the general fund that's project specific. With the increase in gas tax revenues, as we mentioned during, during the operating budget, there is a $1 million transfer from the operating, from those accounts to the capital budget. We could actually absorb all of that account, all of that impact in either the operating or capital budget. In this presentation, I actually absorb all of the impact in the capital budget because the capital budget has more options available to it, but that, that is something we'll continue to evaluate um, as the gasoline tax uh, revenues come in. There, of course, are enterprise funds that are involved in the capital budget. You can see there that the number of capital projects is a small portion of the fund balance for both the sewer and water fund. The debt payment on the sewer fund has been revised down. We're going to go through that in a little bit more detail later, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware that we won't be making a $1.1 million debt payment from the, from the sewer fund. Sewer surcharges are on budget. Sewer capacity are running slightly below budget uh, and interest revenues are ahead of budget in both of those funds. So overall, there is no concern about the enterprise funds ability to deliver on the 2020 CIP. There's also the cash balance. Um, the unallocated unencumbered cash balance was estimated to be $7 million. It ended up being closer to $11 million. So that gives us some breathing room when we're talking about the 2020 CIP. Another important component of our CIP is our tax increment financing. As you can see here, a lot of our debt service is actually supported by TIF funds, about $10.5 million. There are no concerns about the TIF funds being able to support these debt service payments. I've already reviewed the first half payments. Any debt fund, I'm sorry, any TIF fund that had a debt service payment associated with it, I, I took a special care to look at this first half, and I'm confident that they'll all be able to make those payments. Additionally, there are um, some payments from the Perimeter Center and Perimeter West TIFs and the Innovation TIFs. All of those TIFs will be able to make that payment. And this is the first time in the West Innovation TIF we start to see how the Capital Improvements Plan is a plan and it doesn't always come together. And that is an example here where we had a budget amount of about $2.9 million, but there was a Board of Revision decision that um, significantly impacted the service payment revenue leaving the fund balance at $1.7 million. Now, the, the good news is that this, this project has been delayed one year, um, at least potentially more based on the development over at the West Innovation TIF. So we are not going to have to make any adjustments to the 2020 C CIP relative to that shortfall. It is something that will be dealt with in the 2021 CIP. And this is not uncommon. Uh, th this is this is actually has nothing to do with COVID-19, everything to do with using TIFs to run your capital budget and is something, board of revision decisions are something we deal with all the time. We also have a funding source of advance repayments. So the capital improvements fund will advance money to the TIFs to do some capital projects in prior years, sometimes many years prior. 
And then as the TIFs develop, they will pay back the capital improvements fund. All of these payments are on schedule except for potentially the state highway fund, which is not a TIF, which is that operating fund that we talked about that uh, should receive gas tax revenue. So we could potentially see a reduction there, but again, that isn't uh, for certain. I'm just, again, trying to be very conservative. The interesting part of this slide is the Thomas Kohler TIF is scheduled to make an advance repayment of $1.3 million in 2020. It actually owes the Capital Improvements Fund $3.5 million. We could advance, we could accelerate the repayment of that advance into 2020 if we got into a situation where we wanted access to that $2.2 million. So that's another example. 15 months ago, we didn't feel as though we needed that $2.2 million to build the 2020 CIP. As we're looking through it now, if it becomes necessary, that is an area where we could increase revenues without making any additional expenditure reductions. Another important part of our capital improvements program is the debt financing, and we receive that funding on April 2nd, so those projects are able to continue. CIP cash, there are several different sources of cash, the most important of which obviously being income tax revenue, but there are some important sources to note here. The first is that we budgeted 225,000 in income, um, sorry, in interest revenue. That is an actually extremely conservative estimate, and it's really hard to estimate the amount of cash that will remain in the 401 fund because the faster a project's completed, the lower the fund balance will go. So it is not unusual for us to be uh, very conservative in that projection. And in a typical year where income taxes are increasing, the conservativeness of that projection does not lead us to make any changes. In this year, we probably do wanna consider making that uh, interest allocation, interest budget more realistic. So if we look, our year to date is actually $318,000. So we are already about $75,000 ahead of budget. Our 2019 actual was almost $700,000 and we're well on track year to date to meet that. We could conservatively increase our interest estimate by $425,000 and likely exceed that estimate. Again, this is a process of building the conservative budget in a different time frame. We weren't trying to squeeze out every dollar from different revenue sources when we were building the budget. As we're looking through it, trying to make sure we deal with this emergency appropriately, we should examine these assumptions and make them more realistic to the environment that we're in. Additionally, we budgeted zero dollars in developer contributions. This is revenue for the reimbursement of project expenditures for specific projects, and it depends on the project construction timeline. None of these revenues were budgeted in MUNIS. Um, we anticipated when building the capital budget that we would have about three and a half million dollars of developer contributions. About $3.1 million of that would come from the Shire Rings Road realignment, and about $400,000 of that would come from the Rings Farm stream relocation. Now, we would not expect to receive all $3.5 million in 2020. We would expect to receive that over the life of the project. But because they weren't budgeted, we essentially backfilled those developer contributions with income tax dollars in 2020. So it is very possible uh, that we could increase those uh, budgeted amounts to that $3.5 million and free up those income tax dollars to do work in 2020. We also have a sale of a capital asset. The 5,800 building scale is still, uh, sale is still on schedule. It's $2.7 million. And then of course, we've all seen our income tax estimate of $89 million and the previous estimate under the worst, best and moderate case scenarios. As you know, the 25% of this is dedicated to the capital improvements fund. So these reductions of four, nine and about $19 million lead to reductions in the fund 401 of about one, 2.3 and $4.7 million. Putting all of this together just on the revenue side, you can see that we can actually grow the fund balance um, by looking at the revenues that are available to us, even offsetting the budget reduction for income taxes in our worst case scenario. But we're not just going to look at revenues in responding to this crisis. We, of course, are going to look at expenditure reductions as part of that. And here's our, our plan of action regarding expenditure reductions. First, we need a credible income tax revenue estimate. You all know that that'll be available in August or July. We need to identify any budgeted unnecessary expenditures, variance for completed projects and bid but not yet completed projects. 
Then there are important uh, types of projects to further identify, and those are projects that are delayed. Now, I want to make a distinction here between a delayed project and a deferred project, and a delayed project is a third party action or inaction that postpones a project. So that is not a choice that we make. That is an economic condition, a third party, a development agreement, anything that's outside of our control that delays a project. There are projects that we can defer and deferring, deferring a project is our choice to postpone a project. So I just wanna make a distinction there because there's not really anything the city can do if a project is delayed, but we can make a choice if a project is deferred. And then finally, we would ask council to pr prioritize the deferral of additional projects if the steps above did not work. And we are not anywhere near that um, choice at this time. Again, revenue tax estimate, we've seen this slide before. Debt service payments. So this, the first part of this is to identify unnecessary expenditures. And actually when we went through our schedule, we created a placeholder for the 2020 debt service payment of about $1.3 million using income tax revenues from for fund 401. Our actual debt service payment by December 1st of this year will be just under $400,000 and we will not be using income tax revenues to make that payment. We will be using bond premium generated during the bond sale and this money will actually come out of 310. So we essentially have $1.3 million appropriated in 2020 to make this payment that we will not be using. And again, this has nothing to do with COVID-19. This has everything to do with the way the bond sale was structured and the amount of premium re we received uh, makes the most sense for us to utilize this very restricted funding to make this payment this year uh, instead of allocating our income tax dollars. So the net impact of this is a reduction in expenditures in the CIP fund of about $1.3 million. A similar thing happens in the sanitary sewer fund. It doesn't necessarily impact the capital improvements program overall, but as I showed earlier, that $1.1 million payment went down. This is essentially why. We had scheduled debt service payments of $486,000 from the sewer fund. We will not be using that fund to make this payment. We will be using the bond premium from fund 310. So there are some savings there. Variance for completed projects. We're very early in the capital budget season. There are no completed projects. We've saved about $62,000 on the four projects that have been bid, but are not yet complete. So identify projects that have been delayed. The Avery and Shire Rings Road roundabout and Old Avery Road relocation project was budgeted $8.5 million in 2020. That project is delayed, i.e. not our choice, but a function of economic conditions, developer situation, any number of factors. 6.6 .6 million of that will not be needed in 2020. It will be needed in 2021. So from a budgetary standpoint, we could release that money in 2020 and instead of appropriating it, we could allocate it in 2021. So this is an example where the fluidity of the capital budget comes into play. 15 months ago, if you were building the capital budget, you absolutely would have put this money in 2020, but it turns out we're not going to need it until 2021. Now there are some projects that we've identified we can defer. Those projects total about $3.3 million. And you can see there the departments that those uh, deferments uh, impact. Um, if, if we were required to defer projects in order to balance the capital budget fund, that we've identified that 3.3 million so far. I don't think this is an exhaustive list, but this is a good first cut given where we're at in the process. As we move through this crisis, some of these deferments may become delays just on a, a function of the calendar and when you have to build uh, and bid projects. So we could see more deferments become delays as we move through this process and trying to negotiate it. And that's not necessarily a problem because we'll be able to allocate it in 2021 and uh, do the projects at that time. And then finally, the last step would be to ask you to prioritize the deferral of additional projects. And we are not at that point at this time. So we are not asking you at this time to take any action on deferring the council edition um, that's already in the budget. And I think the numbers here support that that is something the capital program can easily handle at this time. Um, if that becomes a situation where we are considering the diversion of what I would call high impact projects, projects that our citizens would truly notice, that would be an example where we would absolutely bring council in early to, to talk about 
what our options are um, regarding that deferral. Putting all these together, you can see that we've identified about $11.3 million in potential expenditure reductions. Now, I won't say those are savings because they're not, right? That $6.6 .6 million for Shire Roan is a reduction from 2020, but it's absolutely money that we wanna keep allocated for future years. So there are certain things in there that I would, I would caution us against spending an additional $11 million, but I wouldn't caution us from knowing that if we had to make $11 million worth of adjustments, we can. Summer of these, this again represents the table that we shown, was shown at the start, the unallocated fund balance, the change in revenues, the reduction in expenditures brings us to an estimated fund balance that keeps us well in the black while executing um, the 2020 CIP program. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions regarding the CIP program. I have some more slides to discuss the North Pool. Matt, I have a question about the Parkland Acquisition Fund. What's, is it allocated yearly? Is there an, a yearly allocation in the Parkland Acquisition Fund for, for Parkland acquisition? Yes, we allocate, well, actually we appropriate about $750,000 annually okay. for Parkland acquisition, which is roughly the amount of revenue it takes in every year. Um, most of the time, most years, we don't end up spending that appropriation and it becomes part of the fund balance. Oh, I see. So it's not set out, it's not an encumbered amount of money. No, it, it is a part of the fund, uh, unencumbered fund balance, right? Correct. Okay. I, I thought maybe that could be used for the pool, but I can see where it's all in the pot. All right. Thanks. It, it cannot be used for the pool in 2020. However, if the 2021 CIP was to get into a situation where we thought we were facing significant income tax reductions, we can change the allocation between the capital improvements fund and the parkland acquisition fund on an annual basis and move that money between the two. That's something that we'll do when we set the millage rates in the upcoming months. Okay, all right, that helps. Thanks. And Jane, just as a point of history, we have reduced the percentage of monies that go to the parkland acquisition fund. That's been, I won't say downgraded, that's not the right word. It's been uh, lessened. Each, the, the percentages that used to go to parkland acquisition used to be quite a bit higher than they are today. So right. I, I don't know that we would ever want to look at reducing them further because then we're going to get in a pickle and not you know, want to have some parkland and not have the funds uh, set aside no. to do so. No, I understood. I just thought maybe you saw that we would see the pool as parkland and you, you could utilize some of the funding for that. But um, I understand. And I knew it was much higher in previous years. Okay. There's uh, a table in the memo associated with the tax budget that details out, out the allocation to the parkland acquisition fund. Okay. Hey, Matt, if, if you would go back one slide from this slide, the one where that totals the 3.3, oh, maybe one more, the details of the 3.3 million, yeah. So uh, when you were looking at the 2020, all of this, it, it, is, it is clear that if we were going to choose to make some adjustments, whether it's the pool or anything else, we've got some su fairly sufficient leeway in 2020. Mm -hmm. If you some, take some of these that are being, um, deferred and looked at 2021. I'm sure you did that analysis as, as part of this with estimated changes, potential things that could happen with TIFs, et cetera. Do you have a projection? If just, let's just say everything that was deferred you thought was gonna be in 20 ended up in 2021. We had a moderate change in um, our income tax um, estimates, et cetera, so forth. If we were to make some uh, decisions to, to, to say fund the pool or whatever, what does 2021 look like roughly? Well, I would say at this point, we haven't made the calculations that would, that would clearly identify that, but the six, you know, in the worst case scenario, we still have approximately $12 million of fund balance. If we allocate the $6.6 .6 million for Shire Road and the 
that we consider deferring, we still have about $3 million in fund balance, which would be significantly more than what was projected when we created the 2021 uh, beginning balance in that CIP. So I think there's still a lot of flexibility and there also might be an opportunity to uh, change the allocation of income tax and TIF supported uh, expenditures when we approach the 2021 CIP. At this point, given what we've identified, I don't have too many concerns that we're, we're sacrificing our future at a, to any great extent. You're always sacrificing the future when you spend a dollar today, right? Because you can't spend it tomorrow too. But I don't think that there's any clear mortgaging of our future by taking any of these actions today, as long as we don't get into a situation where um, those income tax revenues start to come in below our worst case scenario. I think we've got that covered. I think if they start to come in below our worst case scenario, we should look at making some of those expenditure reductions permanent. Maybe some of those deferrals need to go out beyond one year, but I don't think we're gonna be in a situation like that. And um, these numbers support that 2020 is going to be okay and that we're going to be okay as we start 2021. It really is going to be once we have the income tax estimate for 2021, whether we know we have problems or not. And unfortunately we won't have that number until August. Um, one of the things I very much, oh, sorry, I'll just finish. I just a comment here, Christina. And then one of the things I very much appreciate about your, your comments here, and I think that has provided some clarity, and you used the, for, the phrase a couple times, um, making um, more realistic estimates given the environment that we're in. I think what is useful and what I appreciate and will appreciate when we go into the CIP is, you know, there, how do I want to say this? As you said, in prior years, we didn't necessarily have to do this because we really weren't trying to understand exactly what dollars we have available to us. But as we go into the CIP, creating this analysis that says, these are the dollars that you really have for us. These are the, 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 the areas of flexibility, I think is going to be very important because it, it's those types of things that help us make the decisions moving forward. So I, I appreciate that in your work tonight. Thank you. One of the, just the comments to that I, I would state is, I think it's important to create the conservative budget so that it can respond to situations such as this. If we'd have budgeted all of the income tax revenue, if we'd have been maybe more aggressive, maybe we were a little bit aggressive in property tax, which is why I have to forecast potentially being down 200,000, we wouldn't have the, the room you know, pick your favorite analogy, whether it's dry powder or meat on the bone or, or whatever it is to say that we didn't spend everything when we put the CIP together. So now as we're searching for essentially resources to complete the 2020 CIP, they are available to us. And it's, it's, it's very difficult to predict the interest rate um, that you're going to receive or the amount of money really that will be remaining in the capital improvements fund balance. I would hate to get into a situation, not that I oppose more realistic measures, but I'd hate to be too aggressive and get into a situation where in a normal year, I had to allocate backwards and deal with revenue reductions in non-income tax related revenue. Matt, yeah, I would never suggest that at all. I'm saying this is, this is really eye-opening to what those variances are sharing that a little more openly about what those are. I would never suggest you do that. And, and but I think this has been very helpful to say the, this are where those avenues are. And we haven't had that necessarily in the, the prior discussions. And I think that's useful. Thank sure. You. There's also 15 months of experience, knowledge, and truth between these estimates and the, and the last ones that developed the CIP because, you know, you're, I'm, I've got to estimate the interest earnings for 2021 you know, basically right now, I have no idea what, what the interest earnings for 2021 should be. Um, I kind of know pretty well what they're going to be for the remainder of 2020 though, based on where we're at and the actions of the Fed, but I don't know what the recovery looks like. So uh, that, I think that makes a big difference too. So Matt, I think the other thing to remember too is that this is a, a, a capital improvement program for more than just this coming year, right? It's something that if, we, if we're making decisions about deferring projects for the coming year, we can also make decisions about potential deferrals of other projects in the other out years as well. Um, 
So it's really about taking a full look at the whole program. And that, and it is a little tough to do without having those revenue projections, the tax revenue projections um, until over the summer so that we have a better idea of what we might be expecting in 2021 to plan for 2022, right? So it's not just about one year out, it's about taking a look at once we have a more solid footing on what we think is gonna happen uh, in the coming year is also taking a look at the other projects that were projected for you know, 2022, 2023, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the other thing is, you know, some of these revenue estimates end up being a little bit more conservative. That goes all that all goes into the 2021 fund balance. So it's not revenue lost. It's revenue that gets put into work in 2021. And essentially what we're trying to do here is pull that revenue that maybe we would have thought we would spend in 2021 forward to 2020 to deal with this emergency in a way that we haven't previously had to. Right. Right. Exactly. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, anything else uh, for where we are to this point? Okay, so I'll move on to the North Pool discussion. Just a quick recap. The pool budget was appropriated $6 million in debt, debt that we received in April. The current North Pool budget is $8.5 million for a variance of $2.5 million. It's also important to note because this question will have to be answered at some point in time. It doesn't have to be answered today, but during the cost study process, we will have to reconcile how we want to deal with this. And that is that this project was assigned to user fees in 2018 under the amended cost recovery policy. So we set user fees in 2019 and 2020 based on this $6 million estimate. So our, our budget options moving forward are a significant reduction in scope. I think you and Matt Ehrman had a, a discussion on that. We can certainly have more discussion on that. We can make some budget adjustments to the capital fund, including the elimination or deferral of capital expenditures. We can increase revenues that were budgeted too conservatively. Uh, we can always utilize reserve funding of the general fund. We could utilize debt financing for the additional two and a half million, similar to how we did for the six million. We could do some combination of the above. To provide you with some additional information on options two and four, should you decide to move forward with funding this project, this would be our recommendation for funding it out of the 40401 out of cash, essentially. We would eliminate that unneeded appropriation for debt service, freeing up about $1.3 million. We would increase the interest estimate by about $425,000. In ordinance 10-20, we increase the expenditures for the 401 by $142,000 for mobility grants, all of that would be reimbursable. It has not been our practice historically to adjust the revenue when we adjust the expenditure, but we could do that in this case because we do have offsetting grant reimbursement revenue. We could utilize the 500,000 that was encumbered in 2019 for the Dublin North Pool design cost that was not needed. So that's 500,000 that is, that is currently encumbered for design costs that's not needed. So that is part of the, the encumbrances in the current fund balance. And then the remainder, which is about 80,000, we could use out of the current unallocated fund balance. So that would be our recommendation if you wanted to fund it out of cash. If you chose to utilize debt financing, you have a couple of different options. Uh, we have a one year note option that would require no additional payments in 2020 and would be refinanced with the 2021 bond issuance. That would cost about $25,000 and we could have that about 30 days after the ordinance is approved. We could do bond financing, which is the competitive sale, which is pretty much exactly what we just did. That would take about 90 days. We could do a bank purchase, which is a competitive sale of a permanent note, so we would not be refinancing this. The drawback of that is, is it has a 10-year max term, so it would not fit with the 20-year debt payments that we have previously associated with our capital projects. And we can always advance funds from the general fund for repayment with bond proceeds in 2021 as a fourth option. There we go. So those would be our debt financing options if we chose to go that route. And now we're back to the point of having to have a discussion on the options available. Okay, well, this is where it gets hard. Um, we have a lot of information. Thank you, Matt Stifler and Matt Ehrman for providing us a pretty clear outline of what our options are. Um, so now it's time to weigh in and, and uh, 
we're going to have to get the consensus on you know, how we want to move forward. I just had a point of clarity. Is the Delta 2 million or two and a half million? It's 2 million, right? Because of some savings on design. Is that the discussion on the table? Just to be clear. The budget is two and a half million. We've identified half, mil a, half a million in design cost savings, but the budget is eight and a half million and the project is budgeted at six and a half million. So what is that half a million in design savings? What is that? We budgeted $1.3 million in 2019 for design costs and we only expended about 180,000. So there's about 500,000 in the fund 401 that's currently encumbered for design costs that will not be used because we ended up not pursuing the covered option. Okay, so that is real money we could. Yes. It, would, it was intended for this. So really the Delta we're talking about is 2 million. Is that right? I just wanna be sure I understand. I think the Delta is two and a half million and there's an easily identifiable half million dollars to reduce it to the hard $2 million would be how I would phrase it. So Matt, I have a question. I hope you can hear me, it's raining so hard. <laughs> um, you know, trying to decide between whether we cash fund it or whether we utilize bond money. The risks ahead of us anything that is looming in the future that looks like we might need to preserve this cash a little bit, or we'll need to be able to use those possible deferrals for something else. Anything hanging out there that's got you concerned that maybe we should think about using at least a portion of this on debt fund with bond money. I think that's really a, a policy discussion. Of course, at this time, I'm concerned about income tax revenues because I don't know what the future holds. So from an income tax perspective, debt financing is, is the safer choice. Um, but it's not that debt is risk-free. So I understand that there's definitely some concern and some consideration that should be given to the opportunity, the ability to cash fund this. So I think that's really a you know, a policy consideration. I think both are equally valid um, at this point. I'm not overly concerned that we need to preserve cash, that I would recommend debt financing, but I think it's, and it's an option worthy of consideration. And we also have a plenty of, I know that statutorily, we have quite a big uh, rope before we get to a point where we've, over, where we've you know, used up too much debt. But certainly we're very conservative on that. I know that. So to me, it's just that some other surprise might come along, sort of like the pool, mm -hmm. <laughs> whether that's the park, and I hope not the council chambers, but if there's something that you have in your head that makes you think, you know, we need to keep a little cash on the side, I'd want to know about it. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly is true that if you debt finance the whole two and a half million, we could release that 500000 that's currently encumbered for this project back into the fund. And that gives us another $500,000 of buffer. But I think the presentation kind of showed we don't absolutely need that either. Right. Okay, thanks. I guess and, it's important to ask the question, is there an appetite to have the, let's try, I'm gonna to try to break it up into three sections. Is there an appetite to redesign the pool that we, we want to get back to budget? I, I, you know, I, I didn't go to as many meetings as, as Kathy did, but um, the ones were, that I attended, I, I think the, the collaboration between the residents and um, the swim teams and the city was so good and so strong. And they came up with, frankly, a product that was about as perfect as a product you could come up with amongst those entities. I just can't see trying to go back and say, we got to, we're going to have to, you know, value engineer this even further. I, I don't know that I could support that. It was, it was such a good process. It was one of the best processes that we've had with that public engagement. Okay. Does anybody else think differently? If I don't hear of that, then we'll take that off and then we'll just start talking about where we're going to get the money. Does anyone else have a, an appetite for redesigning uh, and reducing the overall cost of the no, but I want to say, I want to uh, give some support for why. 
if you look at the, the two pools that we used as comparisons, um, Grandview Heights, their population is 8,500. Athens, their population is 25,000. 25, so if you go back to my vehicle analogy, I might have gone into a dealer thinking I needed a car for a family of one or two, but I actually need a car for a family of five. So our situation is very different. If the original quote at six million, even though I heard six million dollars at the end of 2019, if that number uh, came about in 2017, and a lot has changed. And the fact is, we don't need a sixty thousand dollar car. We need an eighty-five thousand dollar car. And I would say also in support of that, one of the other things that was clear, if we look at what those costs were, the storm water, some of those. If we went back to redesign it, we're not going to get rid of those anyway. So we would we would do an enormous amount of rework on, and I would agree with Christina, what I think is, was a very good process to potentially save, I don't know how much money. So I, I think when you look at the nature of what those, that additional $2 million, I'm going to go back to that because I think that's a half a million from the design, but that we're trying to, to locate, um, a good portion of that you're not going to be able to to revalue or re rejigger that pool. So I, I, I think understand all that. I'm, I'm just trying to get it out on the table. I, I you know, Matt did an excellent job in his presentation, and, and you know, we we heard those things that you know, even if we were to rebuild an identical pool, we would have some of those expenses incurred. But I just wanted to draw out and make sure that no one no one was wanting to cut the budget. Okay. Then Matt will move ahead into, then you had two options of where to get the money. There was uh, do an additional debt service or the corners and um, come up with some monies out of the general fund perhaps uh, that we might look to, to come up with this. You know, I think we can all agree that the half million dollars that we did not spend in design fees, we would probably like to go ahead and shake your head with me if you disagree, but we would probably like to apply that half million dollars to uh, this so that we're really looking for $2 million. Is that, are we kind of in agreement that that half million we're okay with? Okay, so now we're looking for $2 million and you gave us two ways that we could come up with that $2 million. Um, the first was about eliminating this appropriation and all of this business, which left us a little more than $80,000 short that could come out of the general fund. Or uh, you have out of a current unallocated fund balance, you take roughly 10% or so of that. So uh, that's our first option. Now, Matt, if you can go to your next slide, the next one I believe was about a bond sale or some debt financing. Thank you. Uh, we have basically four choices there of doing a regular note, another bond sale, which I think that I, I don't know that we have the associated costs with a bond sale. It takes, it's, that's not free uh, to do a bond sale. That, that's a lot of money. I'm, I'm suspecting if we only were gonna come up with $2 million, I, I suspect it costs $100,000 to do a bond sale, but I could be wrong. But that may or may not be the right way to go. Bank purchase. Um, that, you know, that whole probably is the, maybe the slickest way to do that, the easiest way to do that in terms of not encumbering other costs, um, but it doesn't fit with our 20 year plan. So we would have to knowingly decide, well, we're okay with this because it's the cleanest, but it, we're not really holding true to our tenants, but we're, we're okay with that maybe. Uh, and then we have the advance the funds from the general fund. So. Can we get to debt financing versus, uh, I'm gonna call it corner sweeping. It's terrible. It's Dana, I'm gonna blame it on Dana because that's what he says. Those aren't my words, those are Dana's words that I'm just borrowing for a few minutes. So debt financing, corner sweeping, which, which uh, are we most inclined, comfortable with? Council members, please indicate. Or something else that you want to think. Those, uh, these are, I'm just trying to move things along. If I didn't include something that you would like us to entertain, bring that to the table too. I'll stop.
Of this list on the screen, I would pick option two. I concur. Is the, does the staff have a recommendation as to one of these options? Since it's, since it's really six of one half dozen of the other, I think I would recommend the cash funding option. Take, take, take the future uh, revenue uh, considerations off the table. We have the money today. We can cover it today. Do it today and be done with it. That's been our tradition is to not become overly reliant on debt. And we can we can achieve that end here. So that would be our recommendation if we were to have one. Not that you would be wrong to move forward with debt financing because that's what we did on the remainder of it. Just if you're if you're if you're asking me to choose, that's my choice. I would concur with that for what that's worth. I concur as well. My only side comment is um, based on conversations I've had over the last month or two with various large general contractors down to the small guys. Um, they're, cut, they're cutting their bids by 10 to 20%. Um, so I would just try to negotiate the best, the best deal you can, hoping that 8.5 isn't the, the final final price we pay. Um, there are folks out there that are starting to look for work. So for whatever that's worth. If I understand option number two, just Matt, to be clear, what we're saying is, is we're, we're, we're adjusting for things we already know are going to happen. So I'm not sure why would we use a cash when when we know when we know these are here and, and sort of getting and I'm using this word the accounting realigned. So why would we take it out of cash and leave these unaligned? That's the part I'm not understanding. Aligning this is what provides the cash to make the appropriation. Exactly. So you're maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding. So you're suggesting number two? Yes. Oh, oh, I misunderstood. I thought you were not suggesting that. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood you. Then I yeah, because that's what we're doing here, right? Uh, Greg, you asked for a recommendation. I think Matt gave it to you. Or where where do you? Oh, then. I completely support that recommendation. I agree with Kathy and Matt and Dana, number two. And John, uh, okay, thumbs up. And, and then Jane, I, I think you might have chimed in and maybe I missed it. I heard Christina, Kathy, Andy, now Greg and John, you already share your thoughts. Right. No, I, I think number two makes sense. <clears throat> as long as math's comfortable that there's not something looming that, that, um, that we might need to use this cash for, but he seems pretty comfortable with that. So I'm okay with two. Only, only the obvious looming, which is we don't know what we don't know, um, but we've identified enough potential options beyond this 2 million to make me comfortable that we could we can make that work. Okay. And Matt, I'm assuming this would come back as a resolution or something to the effect of a reallocation, uh, a, a re, re um, reallocation of sorts that would come to us that we would change it from this fund to that fund. Yeah, this will be included in the second quarter supplemental that'll have a first hearing June 8th. Any further discussion, other thoughts on this before we move forward? I don't leave anybody behind. No? Okay. Uh, then I will turn it back over to Dana. Um, I think we had a little laundry list of things. Um, there he is. Well, I, I think uh, council had wanted some updates on some items. Um, <clears throat> so in my understanding, so uh, I think uh, certainly one of the things that you might wanna be brought up to speed on is our uh, thoughts around reopening. Uh, as you're aware, the governor as mayor, is that okay to go ahead with that one first? Um, yeah, I think that's certainly the most interesting, uh, you know, given the conversation we had today on the trauma call and things, I, 
Okay. I did not understand those things, so I think it's important everyone heard that. So, so as you all are aware, the governor uh, made quite a few announcements uh, as recently as last Thursday about uh, reopening, reopening guidelines, much of which had to do with public pools and, and gyms and um, daycares and the like. Obviously, you know, that has a lot to do with the types of services and facilities that we operate. Uh, I think as you're aware, staff's working on plans regarding how facilities and the associated programs with those could be made available in accordance with the new guidelines. Now, those guidelines, some of which came out as recently as Thursday night, and some of those didn't come out till over the weekend. Um, so uh, our, our planning process is essentially this right now. And that is what I've challenged the staff with is what does right look like if we open our facilities under these new guidelines for public pools, <clears throat> gyms, <clears throat> excuse me, offices, day camps, and the low contact sports, which were all the areas that, that the governor uh, spoke to. So in that planning process then is our, our assumption is that we will open. Uh, if we do open under these guidelines, what can we realistically do to get facilities up and running and what programs can we expect to be able to provide under those constraints of those various guidelines. So, uh, you know, that's a lot to try to figure out. Uh, the one thing I want to assure you is, you know, our facilities started closing back in early March, as you'll recall. Uh, we have not been twiddling our thumbs by any stretch. Um, we've, we've been working lots of contingency plans and thoughts around these things um, all this time. We've also taken full advantage of the rec center being closed. So as an example, where we would normally close the rec center in August timeframe to do our annual maintenance, we've got all that done. So we would not have to close later, you know, if, if we had the opportunity to open up to some level. So we've been making good use of our time. Uh, we've taken a lot of our programming uh, direct, we call it, through virtual programming and the like, some very innovative, creative things staff has done and continues to do and new ideas coming up every day. Uh, so th the point there is staff had worked a lot of contingency plans, but those are only as good as, uh, you know, the guidelines. And we didn't really know the guidelines until just the last few days. So what we're doing is assessing those different guidelines uh, against what our contingency plans were. And, uh, you know, a, a, a rec center, as an example, is a very complicated animal, right? It's, it's not cut and dry. It's very complex. It's it's a facility with a fitness gym. It's got pools. It has a gymnasium. It has a banquet facility. It has classrooms. It has staff offices. It has locker rooms and showers. It has babysitting. It has a teen room. It has senior services. All this stuff that makes our community a community. It's the center of our community. is a great blend of all those things. And it's just, as you know, it's a revolving door with attendance like over a million people attending in a year. So a great centerpiece of our community, but we're not going to be able to operate it like we used to. And uh, hopefully we'll get back to there, you know, at that point sooner rather than later, but in the interim just isn't going to happen that way. We all know that. That's just the reality of it. So what can we best do? So staff is working on these plans. Um, a lot of things people probably don't really think about very much when you think about this, although if you're a retailer, a restaurateur, a barbershop or running a salon, you're going to know by now that your best hope for staying open is how much PPE do you have in stock and how much sanitizing can you do and how much seating can you get in your facility in order that people can access it safely and you can still make, in their case, make, make a revenue. In our case, Rec Center is an example and, and, and outdoor pools and day camps run off funds and they're meant to bring in a certain amount of revenue, although the city does subsidize a lot of that at about 50% on average. So if you look at uh, that subsidization plus probably operating at about 50% capacity, now you're at 25% of what those revenues might otherwise be. So there's, there's all these second, third, fourth order impacts that happen when you start looking at the opening. And I don't want to even focus on money or funds. You know, right now, what we want to focus on is how can we get the, the facilities open? How can we get programs available? and do it in a safe way that meets all these guidelines. So that, so that is the challenge before us, um, you know, and I've got a list of ideas. I'll just run one by you. So as an example with the rec center, um, we would have controlled entry and enforced social distancing, likely would do temperature screenings. Uh, we're looking at technology that would enable that. 
if we can get it in on time, we would we would we would use that or otherwise require people to check. We have, uh, you know, masks would strongly be recommended. We likely would require reservations for a predetermined window of time so that um, we could have closures in between when people would come in and they would all exit. We would go through deep cleaning sanitization and then bring in another group. I mean, that's an idea. It's not, not that we'll have to do it that way, but, but very likely may have to do it that way. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the, the fitness floor and the track may open, but we're already spreading workout equipment around because we're gonna to have to get all the distancing requirements we need. That takes up square footage. How do we, how do we get that done? Uh, we're working on that now. We've actually been moving stuff around already. The group fitness studios would probably be used for expanded fitness space. Maybe even the banquet facility winds up being used for expanded equipment space or very limited classroom space. Uh, group fitness in general, how do you do classes in this environment? The answer right now is, you don't. Uh, we probably do that at a later date um, as the guidelines come out. Um, the gym, how you use the gymnasium is still being evaluated. The low contact sports like is basketball that, is volleyball that, or is badminton that that we do in there and, and, other, and other activities that happen in the gym in an organized and unorganized fashion or pickup game, if you will, have to be evaluated. And, and we have a good sense of some of those that may or may not be able to happen. Uh, we would probably limit the use of the facility to members only. We probably would not do daily passes at this point. It's just too hard to control and to schedule and all of that. Um, so we would also, um, frankly, it would not be the place to come hang out in. I mean, you know, one of the things we're very proud of is our senior lounge. We're very proud of our teen room. Can't really do that that way anymore, uh, at least not anymore, but, but for the time being. So so all those kinds of things have to be wrestled with and could our seniors even interact in that facility because of some of the underlying conditions that may be there and for others. Uh, the lap pool, uh, we probably would do lane reservations and be very scheduled about how that is used. Um, could maybe do some aquatics programming if you could garner separation and uh, control the breathing and also because that has to be looked at even though you're in the water, you know, you're still aspiring, you know, you're still um, respirating, you're still um, uh, breathing, so you have to have to be careful how you do that, and you wear a mask in the pool, don't you, all these kinds of things. How do you manage the pool deck and the separation that comes with that? The leisure pool would be heavily restricted if opened at all, just because kids will be kids, and they're going to, you know, how do you prevent the social interaction, which tends to be high usage of, of, of our younger population, and then locker rooms and showers, just will not be open. Um, you're gonna have to, to wear what you're gonna wear to work out in and then leave the facility and change or shower elsewhere. Obviously we'll have restrooms open, but we'll have to you know, uh, step up sanitizing of those significantly as well, in addition to normal cleaning. So I could go through a lot of these, but those are all the kinds of thoughts that the staff is going through on this. Um, wish we would have had a plan ready to go the moment the governor said open, but until we saw the guidelines for sure, could have kind of guessed probably 60% what those would have been based on things we've been seeing, but the devil's in the details. I will tell you, I was on a call uh, today. The, the mayor mentioned that she was on that call. Even the, the public health experts um, were a little bit uncertain of what these guidelines meant. So they're trying to interpret, we're trying to interpret. Uh, and by the way, we will not open anything without the approval of Franklin County Public Health uh, involvement in whatever we do and improving any plans that, that we might uh, come up with. So even though we might come up with a plan within this next week and have a lot of operational type of plans put together, we got to vet those through Franklin County Public Health and be able to demonstrate that we can execute safely and within those guidelines. So uh, another one I'll, I'll just mention, um, Ballantrae Spray Park is an example of something that we probably just won't open this year. Um, it does tend to draw a lot of crowd to it. Uh, there's no way to affect separation. We don't supervise that normally. I couldn't see us supervising that and enforcing that now. So very highly unlikely that park will even open. Uh, at least that's our plan currently. So, um, you know, I could go on through uh, the South Pole and day camps is another one. You know, we'll have to follow pretty closely to the guidelines that have been put out for daycares. So it's dropping at the curb and monitoring the kids and checking temperatures and 
smaller uh, class or, or day camp ratios. So we would have, we normally have, I think it's nine kids to one camp counselor. We would go with an eight to two kind of a ratio. We have to step that up. Um, and then there's also the physical uh, places that we need to put our camps. Uh, we rely on the schools, Dublin City Schools for some of these locations. And so, you know, we're talking to them about can we or can't we use their facilities and then where else might we put these so that these children aren't around a greater population. So uh, there's just a lot of, um, a lot to figure out. And, uh, you know, we, we do hope, I just want to assure you, I want to assure our public that our approach is we want to be open and we want, our task is to figure out how to open. And then from there, go through the planning process and check off the list of things that we can meet or those things that we may not be able to meet. And if we can't meet those, then we may have to set that program aside and not do it and then see what else we can do. So it is a, it is a process of checklist and uh, trying to make sure that we can, we can meet all that. A another thing I'd just really like to mention too is I mentioned the PPE, can we order it? Can we get enough on stock to keep us operational? It's also staffing and recruiting. You know, a lot of the folks who do day camps and pools, lifeguarding, all that are minors. Um, can they, will they work in this environment? What is the safest way to do that? Uh, that's a lot for us to consider in uh, how we staff this. And that could be a constraint on us in our ability to appropriately staff these facilities and these programs. So I, I could go on and on. I mean, the list is really long, but I'll, I'll kind of stop there. Uh, I think Chris, uh, the mayor, got a, got a little piece of that today and listening to the city managers and others talk about, about all of the challenges uh, through the Central Ohio Mayor's Managers Association. So there were several that said, we're not gonna open. Um, Marysville, there were, there were a few that said, we're opening. Um, we didn't commit to anything other than continuing to participate in the conversation. Uh, we'll probably step up here. Joe Mazzola, the Franklin County Board of Health Director was on the call and he was talking about your pools and this, that, and the other thing. And he said, I just hope you don't open up. Um, which was, was shocking to me, truthfully. I don't know why the governor would say you can open pools and the health commissioner say don't open them. Uh, you know, I, I get, get it a little bit, but it puts us in a very difficult position. And, you know, um, one of the other things I think that we need to think about when we talk about what we're going to do with our facilities is what we're going to allow in our community. What, you know, what level of policing. I, Kathy and I got an email today from a gentleman that was um, unsettled about uh, how dinner ran at the re outdoor restaurant Saturday evening in the historic district, right? So that was, we're, we're going to have to figure out how are we were going to police these things, what methods we're going to use, and the other un unintended consequences of not opening the pool, which will be backyard pools. And we've seen some of those emails thus far, and you know, how are we going to manage, uh, you know, 15,000 backyards in the city um, on a maybe hourly basis? And our, you know, so all that to say that there is, um, there is a whole lot for us to talk about. We need to come to some level. I mean, I appreciate Dana is going to do what he thinks is right and safety measures and things. I also know that he'll, you know, that we need to, this, we all need to be in this together because. Uh, when the emails come, we can't start throwing stones. Um, that will look very unprofessional. It would be a disservice to our residents. They deserve better than stone throwers. So we need to figure out how to get um, to uh, figure out where we're, where it is we're all comfortable and how to get there so we can um, you know be there together. And, and I and I I appreciate that a lot, and I and I appreciate the support of that and I certainly have every intention of including you all in this process um, and, and we'll find a way to get more information to you or pull you pull you in or get it to the next council meeting or if we need to get together before request a special meeting or what have you but um, you know I, I appreciate that you want to be there as that obviously as that decision happens um, and, and as I've said to the staff you know what we have to do is focus on the how to do it and if we try to figure out on how to do it, and then we figure out in that process that we can't, at least we'll be able to better answer the public as to why we can't do something. 
uh, whether that's we can't do all of it or we can only do part of it or, or we can only do these programs and not others. And, and, and we can't, we can't um, you know, explain to our public or justify to the public without going through that kind of a process. So we have every intention of um, if we can't do something, we'll tell you why we can't do it. And hopefully we can do it. Well, this all, much of this came about this afternoon on the call that Dana is referencing. So um, I, I want to make sure that we get, that we talk about this a little bit tonight. I don't know if anyone has any comments. Any, like, you know, it's a lot to take in and you may need some time to process, but um, love to hear thoughts if you had them. Chris, I think uh, Dana makes a point. There's so many aspects of trying to open back up. But, and I think one of the most important things that we as a council have to do is communicate with our citizens this, these processes. Because first and foremost, they need to know that the reason that we're working so hard is because we care about their health. We care about the kids' health, we care about the seniors' health, we care about our citizens' health. Then we have to make sure that we clarify with them exactly what we're doing. Because I think that once we clarify and we really communicate with them these processes, we don't just announce something, then they, they understand and the community, as it happened with DeWine, once you understand what the problem is, once you understand how hard it is to do some of these things, then the community will be more apt to understand it and buy into the decision that we make. And then also I think it's important that we, you know, maybe even put together a community reopening task force or a community task force as we move into 2020, because there are business people that have a certain unique problems they're dealing with that we may not be aware of. You know, there are, there are citizens who, who are very active in the community that might be able to bring input and there are HOA leaders that can come back and bring the message back. We can sit around a table and work together to reopen in a way that the whole community buys into. I don't think I know that we have to make individual um, city decisions from a staff level, and I appreciate what Dave is going through, but I also know that he needs to have the community behind him as he makes, as we all make really tough decisions. So I, I just think it's, it's, you know, that we care, that we need to communicate that, clarify what we're doing and work, collaborate, collaborate, work together to do this together. I think that's really important. Would it be possible, um to more or less poll our residents and find out if the pools were open, would you go? Uh, if the rec center were open, would you go? I, you know, I know there, I suspect there's a segment of our residents that won't go even if it's open. Um, and this kind of brings the community into it. We're trying to figure out what the need is. Dana, you brought up an interesting point a good number of the, the seasonal employees that you have at the pools are, are minors and their parents may not allow them to work. So they're, <laughs> uh, I don't envy you. They're, this is very complicated, multifaceted. It's almost like, where do you even begin? But I would like to know, um, you know, knowing whether people would go to the pool or go to the rec center also helps us figure out capacity. What kind of capacity do we need? Um, helps us address the complicated issues of their member dues and what they pay. I think it's a little different for a pool. You either go or you don't, you pay for that. But for the rec center in particular, you know, if somebody says, well, I don't want to use the pool, but I'll use this or whatever, those kinds of things. So I think it would be I'm curious to know, is it 51% that wants these things open? Um, and it would help guide our decision-making to some degree. Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, comment. And Megan, I, if you can come up for a second, uh, there's been some surveying regarding day camps. Uh, Megan, I don't know if you wanna share that information that, that we've got so far on that. Sure, so just today we sent out a survey to all the parents who had previously registered their children for the day camps and already we have over 100 responses from them and the survey communicates it shares the state guidelines that were had been provided it, you know, 
explains that safety is our top priority. We're planning for the opening. Um, and then it also says we need your help to help inform, you give us information to inform our planning effort. And it looks like so far we have, based on those 104 responses, we already have 40% that are seeking a refund, 20% that have indicated they do want to send their children to the day camps this summer, and then 40% that are unsure and would like to see more details. So as part of the email, we did outline some things that they might expect to see based on the guidelines that were handed down from the state. So it's very good information, um, not really surprising, but it's definitely very helpful to have this type of information to wrap up our planning. And we're gonna be sending out a similar, we have a draft survey um, for the pools, and then we also plan on doing a survey for the rec center. Um. I, I suspect anyone that attends a camp signs a liability waiver. They always would. The yes. COVID-19 liability waiver will put the fear of God in, into you. And I, you know, I don't, you don't want to put the cart before the horse, but if they were thinking about sending their kids and you sent them the paperwork that they would need to complete before they enroll their kids, they might change their mind when they see that thing. And we're, no, we're also surveying the um, those who have applied for the jobs. So we'll be getting responses from all the applicants and those that we had recruited to fill some of these part-time jobs. We'll be getting their input this week as well. Hey, Megan, would it be possible for you to share with us a little bit about what these surveys are as, that are going out? So the camp survey, I, yeah, I can forward the survey to council. Um, the camp survey was emailed to the parents that had registered their children for the camp. So it was a direct survey. The parents are required to fill in a field with their children's names so that we have some control on the survey so that it wouldn't get forwarded to others. Um, but basically it just asked their um, intentions for sending or not sending their children to day camps this year. And it provided an outline of some things that they might expect or some changes that we're contemplating making for this year, which includes, you know, dr dropping off the children at the curb. They're not going to be able to walk their children into the facility, temperature checks, the masks, you know, all those safety protocol, and then the ratios and things like that. So. I think it would be good for that and the, what you're doing with the pool and if you, what other surveys you're doing, because I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting emails from folks that are both yes open and please don't. And so, as I'm sure you all are too, so just understanding what surveys are going out, that would be very helpful. Um, I sure and, and I, I, thank you. And I think as, as Chris mentioned earlier, I, you know, it's, it's going to be hard until, until we see all the details of the plans that, you, that you're working through, that Dana's working through, the staff's working through, because there's so many facets of this. And I think you asked, Chris, does it make sense to find a time for us to get together and share that and talk through it? Because I, I think that's where we're gonna understand what we're actually commenting on, right? What does it mean specifically to open a rec center that, that functions like this? What does it mean to open a pool that functions like this? Because I, I think those details are really going to help us, as you said earlier, get to some shared vision. Because without the details, it's, it's I can sit and imagine them as the, most of us can, but I, I think that's a pickle. So I don't know when we might be able to schedule that, but I would be pro that if, if the rest of you were. I would. I think it's really difficult to understand and comprehend everything just through this conversation. Um, it, I, I would be interested in having an additional meeting so that we can really kind of talk through some of this stuff because um, it is a challenge and a lot of us are facing similar challenges and just in our own work, right? Um, and so there are, and I know a lot of parents who have their kids in the city summer camps, including myself, um, and I'm hearing what they're saying too. It's, and there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of just people being scared and it's difficult because you have some people who are naturally very um, risk tolerant, right? They're like, yeah, I'm sending my kid. And you have people at the other end of the spectrum who are incredibly risk averse. And how do you try to 
bring things together in a way that captures the broadest version of both of those things. And, and that's the, that is really, truly the challenge. Um, and I would really welcome that conversation um, as we move forward so that as we do talk to people, regardless of where they fall on that risk spectrum, we can tell them, here's what we wrestled with, here's, here's how we made the decision. If, to, the, to the extent that we can include that public feedback, I think we should. I think timing is not on our side here, so we've got to be careful about being super inclusive with um, with the public because I think we need to be as much as we can be, but also being able to move things forward in a fairly quick fashion. I mean, summer camps are supposed to start in two weeks, right? So um, we've, we've got a bit of a timing issue there. Well, the one thing I would, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to say about timing is that, uh, in fact, that was a, uh, quite a discussion today, um, you know, while well, the governor said, you know, these things can open as of this date, I'm not using that as a guidepost. Um, I think we have to determine, you know, what time frame is going to work for us. We got to we got to gear up. Uh, there's training. Uh, while we've been leaning forward on hiring staff, I, I I told our staff several weeks ago start leaning forward on hiring summer staff. I didn't tell them not to hire summer staff. So go ahead and start leaning forward. Do the recruitment. Um, yeah, Dean, I wouldn't suggest that you would use that. I guess what I'm trying to say is for parents trying to plan, parents trying to plan in their minds, they're thinking, well, I got to know kind of now if I'm going to be able to even send my kid to camp. We're not going to meet, we're not going to meet that. No, uh, well, that's, but that needs to be put out there because that's not a message that's been put out there. But that's part of that communication okay. I think that Dean was talking about. Okay, we'll put it out first thing in the morning, but we're not going to be able to to meet that. I, I really think that, um, um that was a big part of the conversation at Comma today was a lot of cities were trying to meet these deadlines and, and, and they treat them as deadlines. And there's just, you know, we, we can't really, can we meet it relatively close to that? Maybe, but um, until we knew what these guidelines were and how we bench, you know, work against them. So anyway, but, but the point is, and I hear you loud and clear, we want to get that out sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. In fact, I feel really bad. We don't have that already. My kids went to summer day camps. I know. I know I put them in for, for, and they, they loved them and they went. And so I, my wife and I are the first ones to understand that, that challenge. So I, I feel really bad that we don't, we don't have that answer. You know, one of the challenges in this uh, situation that we find ourselves in is it's kind of like in, in the criminal law, when you try to measure deterrence, when you've done something to prevent someone from committing a crime, it's practically impossible to measure. When we take protective measures to prevent this spread of virus, we subject ourselves to criticism if we're successful. You know, people will say, well, it hasn't been in Dublin. You know, why is the pool not open? And so it's really very, very difficult to, you know, and I'll just give a for example, there's a person that we all know that sent Dana a big long email about how he should not uh, cancel the parade uh, at St. Patrick's Day parade and he should open the bridge and do all of these things um, that he didn't do. And who knows, that could have literally have saved people's lives. We could have had a spread that was, you know, a, a hot spot right here in Dublin because of it, but we'll never be able to prove a negative. We will never be able to prove because we prevented something from happening, something worse didn't happen. And so you're always subject to criticism when the bad thing doesn't happen. People are going to criticize you. You should, you were overreacting. And so that's one comment. It's very, very, you, you will never get affirmation that you made the right decision when it can't be actually measured by people. That, that's one comment. Another comment um, I think if we would have put, I get the idea about asking, you know, surveys and asking people's opinions and would you go and all this stuff. Um, I, I would imagine if DeWine put out a survey the week before the Arnold Classic and said, should I cancel the Arnold Classic? 75% of people would say, why would you do that? Why would, should we be shuttered for the next two months and locked in our basements? Well, why in the world would we do that? It's the really difficult decisions when it's you're defined as you know it's lonely at the top it, leadership is lonely you've got to make sometimes the decisions that are the most difficult ones to make i see the pool as slightly different because 
I see the pool different as summer camps and the other things. I, I think, Dana, when it comes to you um, from, an, uh, from a logistic standpoint, being able to open the rec center in a way that you're comfortable with, you know, I think you can get there. I, people will know what they get when they get there and they'll know why. They'll walk in and they'll know why there are now, um, you know, stair climbers in the hallways and they're separate. People will understand that. And then they can decide whether to go in or not. My concern with the pool, we're about ready to, or we're not going to open the North Pool this summer, right? So we're going to have an entire community descending on the South Pool. So, so it's going to be, it would have been stretched to its capacity already. Um, now you're going to have it be sort of the, it's kind of like the fireworks, you know, if you're the only, only game in town, you're going to get more people. And so my concern is how do you, people generally in the day, this is what my kids did, if they're going to go to the pool, that's what they're doing for the day. And so, so how do you, what do you do? Do we have a big, John line, big giant long line of kids there wanting to get in first? How do you, and once they're in that environment, you know, like you said, Dana, kids will be kids. They'll be wrestling for a Nerf football all day long and it will be overly packed. It will be practically impossible to police it after everybody's in there. How do you have turnover? Do you have everybody leave every hour and come back in? You know, sometimes, I, I, I kind of think about, General, you come to my mind quite a bit in this situation because I think I, I get starting start to feel sorry for my kids, you know, and I'm like, what are they going to do all summer? They're not getting shot at. They aren't, uh, you know, the, the, the sacrifices we're making. I mean, let's keep all of this in perspective here. Um, you know, if you don't get to go to the pool this summer, I'm not sure that that is the end of the world. And I don't know when we say people people think the government is the government if we open the pool there will be some people even when christina said some people are risk tolerant some people are risk averse if we open the pool we are putting our stamp on that pool as a safe place to go and some people may go just because we opened it they may they may be teetering on the fence if you ask them would you go if it was open they'd say i would assume you're not going to open it if it's not safe so we're kind of putting our endorsement out there that it's going to be safe. And the pool for me is different than camps because that's more like the rec center. You can tell them what it's going to be like. This is going to how many kids there's going to be. This is, you got to wear a mask. You got to do this. You got to do that. Now, do you want to go? They can still choose to sign up or not sign up. I don't know that we can control the pool environment as well as we can the rec center um, and camps. And, and the thing for me that also is, I think, really important is the parks, you know, people being able to go out, throw Frisbee and, and get out into our green space and be available there. And that, you know, there is a point at which there's personal responsibility here. We cannot um, go police the parks and make sure that these people aren't too close to each other. But if the parks are open and we say our parks are open, there's just some of our recreational facilities, it's not possible for us to guarantee you it's a safe environment. And, and I think that kind of decision isn't really one for a popular vote because it's not going to be very popular. It, you, I don't believe if you put, if you got a ballot into all 55,000 Dublin residents, should the pool be open, I bet you it's going to, the majority is going to say, yes, it should be because they don't have to deal with the logistics of what do you do about kids crawling on each other? And what do you do about the turnover? How many different shifts of patrons can you get in and out of that facility in a day? Is it first come first serve? I mean, all of those things that make just incredibly difficult. Um, I don't know that that tends to lend itself to sort of a popular vote. And that's what the difficult decisions are for the, the, the seat that Dana is in. And I don't know that many people would make a distinction between what Mike DeWine said was open and what Dana McDaniels in the city of Dublin says. Open. It, it, you know, I, I don't know that they're going to just see the government as the government. And I'm, most my biggest concern is opening the pool. Um, I think that that is an environment that is practically impossible for us to police and to put our stamp on it saying it's a self safe, healthy environment go ahead and send your kids. I, I don't know. And, you know, I go back and forth. Sometimes I think, what the hell? We have just shut down our entire, practically the entire planet for two months. And things aren't so bad. Well, 
Maybe they would have been if we wouldn't have. And you never can measure that. And so it's really, really difficult. So I, for one, uh, uh, completely trust you, Dana, in you communicating with other cities and, and uh, you know, whether it's like Jane mentioned, there's some uh, businesses that are dealing with these kinds of issues as well, you know, getting information as you, I know you would from every available source that you can. But I think the rubber's got to meet the road and it stops on your desk. And, and I think there are a lot of aspects of our community that, we can provide a safe environment. There are some, especially that pool, makes me really uncomfortable because we can't control it so much. And, and I do think that people are coming out, people, I get this sense. I've even had it a little bit myself. I've relaxed. My kid, we were pretty much shuttered for two months. And now that everything's sort of opening up, I'm like, all right, well, Zach, you can go get your hair cut, but you got it, you know, and, and I think there's gonna be this push to get more and more out there. And I don't know that the information is there for BDS to be entirely comfortable that that's the right thing to do. But I, I support you, Dana, and, and the, the decisions that the staff are gonna make. I gotta tell you, the pool thing makes me nervous. I will go back to mute. So Dana, when, when do you think you might be able to to have information that would make sense for us to get back together and discuss. I guess I'd like a little more clarity on uh, how council sees their role in this and uh, and the decision process that you want to be a part of. Uh, and I can be better figure out how I can frame things up. If it's, um, if it's the, you know, I think the result of the analysis is gonna be the result of the analysis. And, you know, I'm certainly willing to to make and plan to make recommendation to council based on that analysis. Um, so I guess um, it would be helpful to me to know kind of what how you see yourselves in in that role. I, I totally get and thank you, by the way, I really want to really mean this from not thank you for wanting to be a part of it and and, and hearing this and, and being part of that process. So I, I, I welcome it and I appreciate it. Um, I, I guess just clarity on, on how you see the decision process happening would be helpful. I, well, I think, uh, go ahead, Kath. No, I, I'm just saying for me, I, I think the conversation started by saying um, for us to understand from a, um, from a perspective of we're all, we're all in this together, we understand what the process is, Getting, getting an overall understanding of what does the rec center look like? What could it possibly a pool look like or not at all look like? What are some of these other things look like? And just be able to ask questions and have a discussion, et cetera, so forth. The recommendations may be, may be obvious enough that it's, it's not that we're weighing in necessarily, but I think without the background of the information, it's very hard for us to understand. And so I think collecting that information, getting a chance to discuss it, getting a chance to talk about what that means from a public perspective. I just think that's an important step in this because I, I think as Greg said, people will see the government as the government. And so we need to be able to, to understand it, ask questions about it, et cetera, so forth. And, and I, I, memos are important. I just think like this dialogue tonight was very important. And I think it's important to get back together and have that dialogue as part of this process. I, I totally agree with Cap. Just you don't have to create work for yourself or for your staff by writing memos and that sort of thing. These conversations on, on this format not only helps us to appreciate all the stuff that every staff member has to deal with in every department, but it also creates a forum for anybody else who's bothered to watch that this isn't easy. This is hard. And and but we're communicating how hard it is. We're struggling with it. We're using the best possible reasoning, as Greg said. This isn't easy. It's, I mean, leadership isn't easy, but, uh, but, but disappointing all these kids about a pool isn't easy. But if it means that we all appreciate and understand what it means to do it and the risks you take by doing it, then this community will stand behind it, I think. And if they don't, then at least they have the facts in front of them. I mean, you can always argue whether they were the right or the wrong ones, but they're there. So I think having this communication, and I'm sure it'll be other things besides the pool. It's 
How do we help the seniors? What's the next business incentive we do? Or what, what is the next need for the businesses? These conversations with the staff members tonight, uh, you know, are gonna be really helpful in helping us to, you know, help you, I guess. I think that's the thing I'm looking for. How do we help you in the middle of all of this? Because all of our thoughts, as Greg brought up some great ones tonight, put in the pool of opinions and give us a better foundation on moving forward. So I, I would just want more conversations like this, you know, exactly like this in a couple weeks. So that's how I feel. Um, I, I think Greg made a pretty compelling argument for not opening the pools. Um, the fact that we, we would be funneling everyone to one, you know, that's that's a heads up comment, Greg. Um, I would say that this, the idea behind the survey isn't really to put it to popular vote and do what the residents want. It's to understand demand. And I've been very surprised that, uh, as Megan said, 20% um, signed up for day camps, 40% wanted a refund, and 40% are undecided. I've been surprised how few people want to have the pool opened, how few people want to leave their house, how, few, how many people want us to enforce some sort of mask mandate in public. Um, so I think I, I, I've been surprised by that. I don't know that every resident in Dublin would go to a pool, but I don't think we leave that open for debate. So my vote right now is with Greg to just take that off the table. Pool is closed. Um, with respect to the rec center, I don't know if having these conversations every two weeks, I don't wanna live and die by the governor's deadline, as Dana said. Um, we have to do what's right for us and operate in our residents' best interest. And if that means it's June 1st or June 15th or June 20th, so be it. Um, but I think this conversation probably needs to be had more frequently than every two weeks. The format, I like this group think um, as opposed to emails. Um, but I don't, you, you guys know the rules and regulations more than I do. I mean, if we can have these powwows, if it's got to be in this format once a week, I'm all for that. Well, this leaves us in an interesting position. Uh, Mirfield is having a meeting tonight. I read the uh, list of how the pools would be opened if they're opened. And uh, so it's, you know, it, it's very interesting. I guess there's pressure on us because the country club is gonna open up its pool also. And I can, I can get it. Um, so tonight there was a meeting and it's concurrent with this meeting. So I had to drop out of it, but I knew a lot of the material before I got in it. So I think also we take our time, we see what happens. We wait until end of June when we think we can do this. And I just wanna see, the weather has been miserable. But then again, you know, we're debating like, how do you control this? We, we've um, chained up the chairs. We're going to chain, it, chain up half the lounge um, chairs and all the sitting chairs. And, you know, how are we going to control this when people show up and really want, and they bring their families and we say, hey, we're full. We just, we can't let anybody else on in this facility. So, you know, those are the kind of things we've been debating for oh God, three weeks, trying to figure this one out too. So. I think it, you know, we're going to probably tie some of our decision maybe back to whatever Dublin does because um, there's, you know, there's that expectation and we also could, um, I don't know, cut a deal with Corazon for the closing of our North Pool and, let, and we go up there and use that facility like we did when we rehabbed the uh, floors of the uh, rec center. So they let us go over there and use their facility. So. And that way we stretch out the numbers and they're not all crowded into the South Pole or the Rick Center Pool. But it's, go it's going to be really difficult just trying to get people um, in control and under, you know, without just huge disappointments um, coming to go swimming. And I think we're actually passing a thing and that um, if you're not a member, you can't bring your children or grandchildren. 
we're going to really limit the numbers. But uh, so, and, and the concession stands, we've got rules for that. We're just going to have um, prepackaged um, foods if we if we open up. Uh, no popcorn, no hot dogs. All that's going by the buy and by the buy and buy. So we've been working our way through all these details, trying to figure out you know what's our best best shot at all this. So. It's difficult. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Well, Dana, you were asking, you know, what does that look like? I, I think, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, basically what, once you think you're getting close to a decision or once you think you're getting enough information to, uh, you know, be that every every week, every 10 days, every two weeks. I, I don't know how those chunks of information will come, but when you have a chunk of information that you feel is worth chewing, um, that, you know, we would schedule another work session similar to this and, uh, you know, have those conversations just so that we all understand and have the opportunity to ask questions before, you know, the public comes at us when we roll it out. Well, thank you. Matt. I was I was looking at calendar, and uh, you know, I was thinking maybe <clears throat> maybe getting together on Wednesday the twenty seventh for an update. Um, you know, it could be we might be able to get some of this nailed down a little bit more tightly, and it might come in chunks um, or one venue at a time. Here, um, now remember too. I hate to remind you of this one, but I will. Uh, we're going to make a decision around Irish Festival, too. So add that to the mix. Um, so I was really hoping that we could make that decision in early June um, or by your June meeting or at your June meeting. So, you know, probably doing this every every week or 10 days is a good thing. Uh, let me let me get into calendar and try to sync something up. Um, and, and compare that to agendas as well. I'll try to leverage council meetings as much as possible since some of those agendas have been fairly light. Um, uh, I know I need an executive session at your next council meeting, if you all can do that on the 26th. So that that takes up some time that we might could have used, but um, I hate to bring in a, the, the next night and put you on overtime to come in to do that, but um, uh, might, um, have you come in on the 27th if we can, but I, but again, that's something I want to verify with the team to see if we can, can make that happen or not, but I'll get you a, um, a proposed uh, sort of synchronization here on, on how we could do that. Oh, I lost it again. Oh, God. Okay. Well, um, order to nine, um, Mayor, I think you had one other uh, question, maybe around outreach. I had Christine Nardecchia uh, on here. If you guys had any questions about some of the outreach efforts or any other ideas or thoughts, um, I thought I want to thank her for for hanging in here during this meeting. In case you in case you had some questions. Okay. Well, um, I think that we. We all received the email about senior lunches and things like that. Um, there's been some other uh, information floating around. Um, and I think it warrants a discussion amongst us is what, you know, what is our vision for community outreach and engagement? And, um, you know, I, I think the great thing about the senior lunch thing kind of brought it all towards the front of our minds of thinking, you know, how do we want how do we want to uh, be as a city? What, what do we feel like our role is in some of these spaces that we never thought we were gonna be in and all of a sudden we're here. And, and now we need to figure out what we want our role to be that, now that we're there. So uh, we open it up to the floor and welcome some initial comments. Um, I'll mention something about the lunches which, which struck me and I think Greg made a mention of it too, is that when we do reach out to people as the lunches, especially when the city, <coughs> excuse me, when the city's, it's coming out of our tax dollars or for the, for this lunch, there were four of them scheduled 
three of them were sponsored and they were planned for seniors. One of the things I think about is as a city, we're trying to lift up and thank, say our first responders. Um, I'd like to see if we're gonna do a lunch like that, maybe a lunch to some of the caregivers that are in our assisted living facilities. Um, I do think we have to talk about how we make these, these uh, gestures because we have the faith community doing it. We have nonprofits doing it. So where do we fit in? But I think that we have workers here in our community that are first responders that aren't getting paid any attention to. So I'd even throw that out. I mean, I'd say, this is where the discussion centers around. What is it that we're trying to do? Why are we trying to do it? And who do we want to, who do we want to do this for? Um, we've done something for police. We've done something for fire. We do something for the nurses and the doctors. And then there's this other element that are our, our workers that are coming in every day, taking care of our seniors. So I would like to have that discussion with Christine about what is our role in the, during this pandemic as community outreach. So my, dis, my suggestion doesn't necessarily have to be one that's used, but it does, it does kind of open up the, the box to say, you know, what is it exactly we want to do? So if I could just respond to that, we, we are up to having six restaurants on board and several more sponsorships. What we were trying to address was isolation. I mean, remember, we're making phone call outreach by the hundreds to our folks who are aging in place. They don't want to go out. They are not trusting of going to restaurants yet. Not about the restaurants, but, and I think they need to see some friendly faces. This is definitely in the space of city senior services that have senior programs within rec centers. There are cities who are doing that. And the faith community and I have this discussion that we could make it happen. In terms of the first responders, as you know, I think Jane, to your point, no first responders are accepting any donations, food donations, uh, or the like. Um, there are a lot of, there is a lot of attention being paid to first responders in our medical facilities in terms of donations being sent in by the community. We are not tracking that. And then in terms of the caregivers in our senior living facilities, we are having a discussion about an Irish theme outreach around the week of the Irish festival to get sponsorships for scones and tea and things to get out to those caregivers. The stress point is on those seniors who are aging in place and fall between the cracks, who are not getting services from places like Meals on Wheels or Soyce Point, um, or who need to go to the pantry. And so in looking at best practices around the country and seeing what a lot of cities are doing addressing this isolation, this was one of those solutions. I felt it would have been a nice gesture to have council just sponsor the first opening one. Um, to say, hey, seniors, we, we support you. And uh, that was the idea. I didn't want you to feel excluded. I wanted you to feel included. Now, in terms of the 250 number, it's a best guess. We have to start somewhere. It's an RSVP system, which once again gives us another touch point, another phone point or an email point with these folks who are at home. Um, so we think we have a pretty good system in place. Um, we have a number of restaurants who are working. Uh, we just brought on Chartwells and Bob Evans today uh, who are really interested in this sort of touch point to our senior community. Christine, how, how does it work when you, I know that you make the phone calls out. So these are seniors who would be able to drive and pick it up. Is that correct? Now That's it's a different group of seniors every week. Um, the same group comes then once a week gets a lunch. I mean, I think part of the confusion is not knowing how this works and what pop how wide the population is. Here is a paid membership of Dublin Community Senior Citizens through the Rec Center. There are clients who are driving, uh, who are members of the Forever Dublin Center. And then there are seniors who are members of our volunteer community. It will be a direct mail. We have to remember these folks are not getting their information from websites and social media. So we're doing a direct mail. It will be a weekly call in RSVP. Thanks, Christine. You bet. 
if we, I'm sorry, Christy, I didn't, I, I didn't understand what you just said. So it's the pool of seniors or people that already belong to that belong to the rec center. Could you say that one more time? Sure. There was a pool of membership of that called the Dublin Community Senior Citizens that belong to the rec center. Okay. There are a number of clients who are aging in place through the Forever Dublin program that's overseen by Centero. And then we have a pool of volunteers who fall in that category as well. Those have been the focus of a lot of our phone call outreach. So they will get a mailing and they will make reservations. When the seniors have a potluck, about 100 people show up. So we, we don't know what the response will be, but we feel pretty confident that sponsors and restaurants would adjust accordingly once we step out there and give it a try. We'll make it very clear. We're just giving this a try for six weeks. Are there seniors out there in our community that maybe don't live? I, I went with Keisha Fallon a couple of years and did the deliveries of the, and you see some of these people that, that are not in a facility. Um, you know, they're living in their apartment on their own. And that person that brings them their meals on wheels is maybe the only person they see in large measure. So they're not out driving. Is there a way to get to the people who are even more, these people that already belong to a club and they drive, you know, I, I get, I'm not, I am, please don't take anything I'm saying as a criticism of this program. I'm asking about potential other approaches. Are there ways to get to some people who don't drive, who don't maybe have the social inclination to belong to a club um, that, that aren't interacting? Is there a way to get to the, that aren't in an assisted living facility where they've got sort of advocates working for them? So here's the kind of people that I'm thinking. The people that are in the Meals on Wheels program, but that aren't in it, that are now in the circumstance because of this pandemic. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it's like the, the anti Meals on Wheels people who could use it now who weren't in it before. How do we find if there are those people that we could be helping? Those are the people we lean into for Forever Dublin. I mean, that was really the very purpose of, of getting this Forever Dublin program started, partnering with Sintero and their older adult specialists. In terms of those who qualify for Meals on Wheels or Source Point, there has been a, a drastic increase in food availability and delivery service availability to them, and they are responding. Um, we monitor three to four times a week, every one of those agencies about their capacity, their service, what can we do to help? How can we get more food to them? They're fine. Um, so we, for example, just put out today in the HOA uh, leadership update, uh, the state's new program for daily phone calls. So we're getting that information out when those other agencies can't or aren't just because we have such a direct link to our residents. Uh, and one final question. When you say first responder, do you are you referring to police and fire or is first respond? I think sometimes in my mind, I think first responder is the first person to show up to a problem. And in this circumstance, the first responders are a little bit different. I mean, obviously Washington Townships can, you know, transporting people to the hospital, but some of the first responders are these you know, you see these videos, these poor nurses are pulling on like four different masks and a hood and a thing and this stuff that they're exposing themselves to. In my mind, I see them as first responders in this circumstance. Is there any way to get to those people? And, you know, maybe double, I don't even, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I don't even know if we have a COVID person in our hospital right now. I don't well, know I, if it's done to our yeah. um, medical facilities here in Dublin. Yeah. Dana, I think you may know too. I, I don't think as Dana communicates with Franklin County, I think our hospital is fine. Census is perfectly manageable there. Um, I'm not saying they're not working hard. We could certainly give them a call and sort of get a feel for how the community has been supporting them and what sorts of things we could do. I just happen to know they're getting a lot of letters and artwork and cookies and pizza and those sorts of things from residents. So we probably need to tell that story a little bit better and share that kind of that kind of love. Police and fire is who I was responding to as first responders, and no, they they will not accept any food or donations. 
Yeah. And Christine, please don't take anything I'm saying as a criticism. I'm just trying to think. Yeah. To, sometimes I sit here and I think, what can I do to help? And yeah. you do so much already. I, I, I'm not I'm not trying to wiggle my way into your area of expertise. So I'm asking the question. No, I think that future think we definitely need to think about a very big, you know, last year we had our first evening of gratitude. We probably need to readjust that scope to be much larger. I find this very helpful, Christine, because when, when we first got the memo, not understanding who your pool of people is, it clarifies that quite a bit. These are people that aren't using the rec center now. They're not gathering in ways they could. We've had to close this down. They're identifiable. That's different. And Greg, when I use the word first responder, and I do think that this is something that I'd love to have Christine look at, my own father's at a facility, and I know I know that the people caring for him and the residents there are probably putting in as many, if not more hours than many of the people in the hospitals and, no, and they're getting paid minimum wage and they're doing the hardest of the hardest work and they're doing it because they love what they do. So those are the people we can't forget as well. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I they just- will take, They will take food. They, they will. I, I they send will. one to meet to my mom's <laughs> facility. So yeah, they will. They will take food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christine, um, so we, we are talking about that, that delivery during Irish Festival Week to those facilities. And we do speak with them once a week as well, all the 12 in Dublin. Sorry, sorry, Kathy. No, no. Um, again, this is helpful. I, I know there's so many different groups around the city doing you know, Dublin Bridges, I mean, I, I, the food pantry, there's so many folks that are doing amazing work, right? We know this. I, I think what you're hearing is maybe, I, I'll just speak for myself then, is not really understanding who does what, what our role is in this, what other groups role is. And, and maybe it would be helpful to provide some clarity around that. Be this glad. is what Dublin Bridges is doing. This is what, you know, uh, Welcome Warehouse is doing. This is what the food pantry is doing. And here's things that we're doing. Um, and I just think, I think that would help us because I think as Jane started the conversation, how do we plug in? I'm, I'm not sure we, we have a sense of those scopes of things. So I think that would helpful because there's so many people doing amazing things. We don't want to duplicate that, but I think as Greg said, maybe find some of those niches where, where we need it. So perhaps providing that would, would give us some understanding um, of where, you know, where from a city perspective, it's needed and makes sense. Be glad to get that information to Dina in addition to, I think, what you might be receiving on a regular basis from him through our daily uh, updates. So I'll be glad to uh, sort of parse all that out. Yeah, I think it's more holistic view. We're, we're, to your point, just sort of how it, how it fits together and, you know, what our role could and should be in this environment. Um, and possibilities. Thank you. Christine, this is Andy. I would just echo um, Kathy's comments. I'm kind of overwhelmed by all of the different, um, all the different constituents that have needs, some that will or will not accept food. As you pointed out, I've tried to help the hospitals and first responders and they just won't accept that stuff. But I'm also overwhelmed by all the different organizations that are um, sponsoring these outreach programs. And so I struggle to figure out where we fit in. Is this something that we've done in the past? Is this something that we want to, I guess, set a precedent of? So anything that you could do to kind of put a framework together for the new guy, at least, would be very helpful. Be Thank glad you. to. Be glad to. So Christina, this is John, and I just want to say thank you for clarifying this, because that was my big question is, who are the recipients? And uh, I agree with Andy that if you could just sort of put this a, a bow around this and package it for us, it's really going to help us. It's a neat, great idea, really, at this Well, I, I also want to say that the other plus to this is we will get a care package of information to them. Um, we've worked really hard to get online instructions to our senior community, how to get your pharmaceuticals delivered, your food, your groceries. So we'll be able to put that on paper so that they can actually tangibly see it and hold it and read it and get information to them. 
Um, and I will just take, make one final comment that according to our partners at Centero, the number one uptick in phone calls they're experiencing are caregivers around the world calling concerned for their parents aging in place in Dublin. So, you know, we're so, we're so lucky to have that information to see any way people can come together to help. Thank you. You know, I would just add, you know, when this position of outreach and engagement was um, was put together, uh, you know, I, in my mind, it was outreach and engagement. It wasn't necessarily um, it, it wasn't necessarily providing. Um, and, I, you know, we have great I, I call them mercy ministries. We have great folks that do mercy ministries around the city. And, you know, I. I get the isolation piece. I'm not sure that our seniors are more isolated than our stay-at-home moms with a couple of kids. Um, I, you know, I think I, I think our own children. I, I think that isolation runs runs really wide in our community right now. Um, so I, I really think that we need to talk policy about what is it that we think is the appropriate role for us to play in this space. Um, do we want to be another provider um, for food? You know, are we meeting a need? Um, or do we want to be in uh, kind of help in the mental health space? Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I just think that we need, we, um, this brings to light some things that we need to figure out what it is, how are we going to, how is this position going to work? What is it that we do? And um, because my my understanding of it previously was that we were kind of a seamstress, or we knitted together all of the pieces of the fabric so that it was a beautiful tapestry that was, you know, well attached to one another. Um, it kind of feels like we're we're doing that well, really well, so thank you for that. And, and that we're also adding a sprinkling of a, of a provision of sorts. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't wanna send the message to any of our mercy ministry folks of, that they're not doing enough or that they're, um, there's gaps in their service, because uh, I think they're doing really well. And um, I, I just think it's important that we really, we probably, didn't do ourselves a great service because I don't know that our vision was very clear of what this was that we as a city were creating when we did the director position for community outreach and engagement. Um, so it's a great opportunity to circle back and say, okay, what is it exactly that we want? Now, now we have this great position. We have this wonderful person doing it. What exactly do we want them to do? So I like your analogy of sewing, and I just want to be very clear, that's exactly what we're doing is facilitating this. Um, it is our mercy ministries and it is our faith community that want to do this, but they don't have the connections or we just sort of had a meeting literally a week ago and this all came to fruition. They want to be able to use the fronts of their buildings, their porticos. They want to be able to use their volunteers. They may be able to financially support a cookie <laughs> thrown into a boxed lunch. So that's what we're doing is facilitating. I think it may have gotten a little elevated when we asked for you to sponsor the very first one as city council. So we can take that off the table um, and go forward with all of our other sponsorships um, or just go forward as planned because we wanted to get this off the ground June 3rd. And then in terms of my role, um, I'll have that discussion with Dana. It is, it is. I think we're all serving different roles and more expanded roles. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to confuse, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve in the here and now with the long-term, I mean, the long-term vision of changing that division and mayor, thanks for, for bringing that up was to be that person who <clears throat> would help to connect a lot of these different, we were very disconnected as a community, frankly, to these organizations. And what, I, what we wanted to achieve when we redesigned this, the, the volunteer position to also include outreach was that we had a liaison from the city staff that was much more focused and dedicated time, more so to these connections. 
it got really highlighted in the emergency situation where, you know, we were actually asked to come to a meeting and then asked to serve as the, the, uh, the folks to help sort of, I'll use your description, weave together the, the collaboration. Uh, we had the relationships, we had the understanding, uh, but in the context of this emergency was very different. So, um, I mean, that's, and then, and then, uh, you know, the, the emergency disaster planner guy comes out of me, I can't help myself in these kind of situations and thinking about, you know, our own, I have to remind people a lot of times, not you all, you all know it very well, our, our own pandemic plan said expect to lose 30% of your workforce, 30%. So what we, what we did was lean forward in this role to say, we expect that the pantry will lose staff. We expect that Meals on Wheels will lose staff. We expect that these people providing these services will lose staff and will not be able to fill the void. And we prepared to step into that void to fill it. And that was just a disaster response kind of a um, kind of an action, but it's kind of taken on more of a life in a good way because we've got this daily report, which I share with you all, that, that talks about the status of each of these organizations and, and where where things are, are going and what the needs are. So it's been a great exercise um, in a way, but it's also been a reality uh, too. And so to, to everyone's point here for what it's worth, I think it, I think if anything, to me, it's lifted up the need to, to kind of continue in that role in the future. Uh, because our, as, as we said, when we established the position, our community's changing and, and the needs are, are changing and will change as part of that, so. So Dana, as, as part of that, to your, to your point about the needs are changing, et cetera, I think the other thing that's happening is we're seeing organizations like um, um, Dublin Bridges step up and, and, and they weren't here, right? So we're, we're seeing a change in the whole fabric, right? We're seeing our a liaison role, but we're also seeing some really dynamic things happening. So, you know, help us, help us understand that holistic view and make sure that you know that we can understand where how to do that in this new environment and to your right this shines a light on things that maybe we didn't want it but there's some positives about that but there you know the other organizations are also really stepping up their game as well so you know what are we learning from what they're doing and and how do we bring it together and as we go through here what a wonderful place to be right what a wonderful place to be Yes, and how do we and I, I will say that the Welcome Warehouse and the foundation too have, have really, really stepped up um, and they've all sort of found their lane. Um, so I will put that information together to give the whole picture. And I also will include the work we've been doing with the faith community just because they appreciate having a central source um, to speak with and connecting the nonprofit community with the faith community and the schools and us has really just been magical to the point in the future, I think we'll start to be able to gather some real data that could inform some great community decisions. I think it's important that we understand, you know, when we do fundraising in the community for the 4th of July, for the Irish festival, for any of the other events, uh, the, trunk or tr the trick or treat, when, when we solicit our residents um, for donations or discounts or whatever on those known entities that we know what that money is going to, um, going to support and um, you know, the causes that it's going to further, I think that's really important why we circle back around on the policy around this. If we're going to be soliciting from our community, uh, not donations, but discounts or in-kind or partnerships or help, to understand um, what it is that we are trying to fund. We know what we're funding with you know, all of the other events that we do, Memorial Day, whatever it is. We saw that list of who wanted deferred and who wanted to move to the next event and things like that. I think it'll be good policy conversation for us as council to have and say, you know, what is it that we're trying to fund here and, and what are the sources of funding we feel comfortable going to? Um, so, but thanks, that. that's really great information.
Okay, anybody have anything else? Nope, okay. Uh, Dana, did we hit the, the highlights? I think so. Good, okay. Well, you know, if- I, Hey, uh, gang, I just think it's uh, important for us to get uh, Dana out front on these decisions and, and uh, come back with the information to SAP and for us to uh, to uh, support him because he is our city manager. So the faster, the better. And uh, you know, he is the guy that's carrying the load and understands every, every nuance of this whole thing. So uh, it's important for us to not so dilute the decision making to the point where we're ineffective, but uh, let him be the uh, center driver. And I appreciate the fact that he's so inclusive in trying to get us into all this. Thank you. Good. Uh, any other any other things uh, folks had that they wanted to address we didn't get to tonight? Well, we didn't make a decision, uh, and I do think we should. Um, Christine has this project. I feel comfortable understanding now clearly that it is our seniors from our different organizations that aren't being served by us in other ways that they normally are. I'm very comfortable supporting that coming from council for the first. So I at least want to say that and put my uh, vote out there for that. Right. Any other thoughts? Okay. Well, um, thanks, gang. We uh, tied up a lot of your evening staff this evening. So thanks for um, hanging with us. Sure do appreciate all of your time. Uh, thanks, Council, for your time and everyone's thoughts. Uh, we're getting a little better at the Zoom thing, I hope, and it's getting a little bit more conversational. So um, appreciate your time, General, and all that you're doing. And, um, you know, I mean, John's... John's right on. I mean, we, we need to go and do the things that we need to do. And, you know, hopefully we can just have brief conversations about them as time permits and we'll, we'll keep pressing on that. Um, but without anything else, I guess we are adjourned. Have a good evening, everybody.